As long as I can remember, something has been following my father. And one day, I know it's going to catch up with him. Every night I pray to a god that I no longer believe in. Please just don't let it be tonight. I'm only 16 years old, but I've lived in so many different towns, in so many different states, that I can't even remember them all. In my life I've grown all too accustomed to living out of boxes. Every couple of months I make sure that all my things are organized and in their boxes. Because I know that any day now my father will let me know that it's time to move on. I don't particularly like it. And I do feel a twinge of passive jealousy at other kids my age who are given the opportunity to know what it feels like to have a home. The word home is a foreign concept to me. But I never complain, because I know that my father doesn't want this life for me any more than I do. He has offered before to let me leave, and I would be lying if I said I've never considered taking him up on the offer. But I can't bring myself to do it. I'd rather us be lonely together than apart. I don't know what's chasing him. I've tried to speculate about it before, but the answers I come up with fill me with a cold, breathless terror. Some things are better off unspoken, unheard, and unthought. The clues that I do have are memories that I keep stored away in the back of my mind like dusty, old crime scene photos. And like a crime scene photo, each snapshot is a brutal horror, too real to possibly be imagined. But right now, I am lying under my bed with my eyes closed tight, and the memories laid before me, piercing them together with bits of red string, searching desperately for the clue that will save my life. In the first snapshots, I am not yet five years old. I'm sitting up in my bed with my eyes held so wide open that it hurts, but not as much as the fear that is gripping my chest and squeezing tighter and tighter. Footsteps are barreling down the hallway straight from my room, and somebody is screaming my name. I think it's my father, but at this point I had never heard him scream so I'm not sure. The footsteps reach my door without pausing, and then the door doesn't open. It explodes. My father is in the room, and he snatches me up with such ferocity that my shoulder makes a terrible snap. But I don't feel the pain. Not yet, at least. I look up at my father's face as he whisks me out the door, and into the car, and see that he isn't angry. He's just as terrified as I am. In the second snapshot, I am somewhere around five or six years old. I know this because I am wearing the red cowboy hat that my father bought for me for my fifth birthday, but it has no rips or stains yet. Moving around as much as we do means that we are poor, so there's no telling what secondhand shop my father bought it from, but it means a lot to me. My father bursts through the door and tries to smile at me, but it's more of a grimace. With every step he takes toward me, he throws a backwards glance over his shoulder. He tells me to wait outside while he puts things in boxes. I'm sad to be leaving this house because it had morning glories growing outside my bedroom window. But I'm happy that this time we will be bringing things with us. I'm jolted back to reality when I hear a thunderous, splintering crash like a door being busted down. I wonder if God realized that I don't believe in him. And that's why he hasn't answered my prayer. Then I remember that sometimes God says no. In the third snapshot, it's the day before my 10th birthday. My father has been sneaking in packages all week and I know that he has something special planned. I've watched him take things up to his bedroom. And I know that he is hiding something in his closet. I've just got home from school and he is not home which is a rare occurrence that I take advantage of. I go up the stairs into his bedroom and feel goosebumps immediately spread across my bare arms. As I reach for the closet door, I feel a chill that echoes through my body and I foolishly think it's caused by guilt. 
I open the door to feel the coldness magnify and look into pure darkness. Even the sunlight coming in through the window keeps its distance from the inky blackness inside the closet. I try to slam the door shut, but before I can, the darkness is seeping out and staining the walls and carpet around the door. I run out of the house and sit on the sidewalk crying. My father pulls up a few minutes later with groceries. I try to explain what happened, but before I can finish, my father has already bundled me into the back seat of the car and we are driving away. We celebrate my birthday in a motel room. In the fourth snapshot, I am 13, and I'm sitting at the mall by myself. My father has errands to run and after the last incident, I am no longer allowed to be in the house by myself. I'm holding down the power button on my phone, wondering why it won't turn on. It's probably because I've dropped it five times in the past month. Finally the light flashes on, and I smile, but that smile quickly fades. There are seven missed calls from my father. He only left one voicemail. Get back to the apartment, now, but don't go inside. Sit in the car and wait for me. I frantically try to call him back, but he doesn't answer. It usually takes me ten minutes to walk from the mall to our apartment, but I run it in five this time. I get to the car, lungs burning and legs shaking. To see it is already filled with boxes. I climb into the passenger seat and watch my dad come out of the apartment with one more box. When he gets in the car I tell him I'm sorry and he hugs me tight. As we drive away I can see his bedroom window from the road. It's completely black. I hear a creak and recognize it as a third step on the stairs. I open my eyes and realize that it's cold so I can see my breath in front of me. All I can see from under the bed is the hardwood floor of my bedroom, which the moonlight has turned an icy shade of pale blue. If I don't figure out something soon, it will all be black. In the fifth snapshot I am 15, and I am lying awake in bed, like usual. The slightest noise, real or imagined, is enough to send me into a panic. I don't dream anymore. My sleep is never deep enough. I can feel fatigue clawing at my burning eyes, begging me to close them, but I can't because some wild and feral part of me is getting ready to bolt from my bed and through the nearest exit. The sound comes again and this time I am sitting on the edge of my bed with my bare feet on the cold floor before I even fully register that I heard anything. Then I remember that it's early August and we have no air conditioning, so the floor has no reason to be this cold. I'm confused because my father should be ordering me into the car. I should be able to hear him barreling down the hallway to get me. For a split second I wonder if he left me behind, but a quick glance out the window denies my suspicions. The car is still sitting in the driveway. I creep from my bed to the door. My legs feel old and rusty. When I look down the hallway I see that his door is still closed, and there is no light coming from underneath it. It takes all of my willpower to fight the instinct to run, but I manage to make it to his door. I feel that same chill go up my arm that I felt when I was nine, and against my better judgment I fling the door open. My father is lying on the bed, on his back with his arms and legs splayed like a star. His eyes are wide open, and he is staring up at the ceiling and whispering something that I cannot hear. The darkness is spreading across the floor, the walls, the ceiling, and making its way towards him. A bit of it seeps into the blankets on his bed, and I release a scream that is so large and piercing that it lights my throat on fire. My father's head snaps towards me and he springs up. He leaps off the bed narrowly dodging the liquid darkness that is following after him, and we run out of the house together. This has been a long battle for him, and he is finally tiring from it. That is the night I realized that I am the one protecting my dad now. I can hear my father's voice calling out my name, 
but I'm not sure it's really him. He sounds very slow and slurred. How I imagined he would sound if he was drunk. I want to run out of my bedroom and go to him, but I know that would be no different from suicide. This thing outside sounds like my father, and looks like my father, but it is not him. It's only wearing him. The last snapshot is from today. The morning as I was leaving for school, my father was already awake, sitting in the kitchen by himself. I wave at him, and although he looks directly at me, I don't think he sees me. The two black eyes adorning his face are caused purely by a lack of sleep, and I think to myself that we are probably going to move again. When I come back home from school, he hasn't moved. I go upstairs to my room, make sure my things are packed, and prepare myself for the inevitable. It's at the door now. I can tell because the darkness is seeping through the crack underneath it. The tears that fall down my cheek feel hot against my chilled skin. I wonder what it wants with me. It has my father. Why does it want me now? I walk down the stairs, wondering why my father hasn't told me to get in the car yet. He is sitting at the table, still, and the darkness is creeping up all around him. It is dripping off the ceiling in thick, dark blobs, and splattering on the table in front of him, yet he is still unmoved. I call out to him, and he looks up at me for the first time today. He stares at me sadly for a few seconds before slowly shaking his head and then dropping it into his hands. I call out for him again and again, but if he does hear me, he pretends not to. I watch as the darkness starts at his outer extremities and works its way inward. Swirling as it mixes with his skin, I try to run for the door, but it has spread out of the kitchen now, and is closing in around me as well. I run out through the only opening I see, which leads upstairs. As I run, I hear my dad scream out, Run! Hide! Don't open the door, no matter what. It doesn't actually matter if I open the door or not, because the darkness is oozing its way into the room, staining everything it touches. I dash out from under the bed and, for a sickening moment, my brain feels like it's sloshing around inside my skull. I am positive that I am about to faint. My vision finally focuses and I see that the darkness is halfway across the room and headed straight for me. I open the window, and the warm summer air blasts refreshingly in my face. I glance down. It's a two-story drop. Am I willing to do it? One glance over my shoulder at the darkness making its way toward me answers that question for me. I drop down and hang from the windowsill by my fingers, working up the courage to let go. I can see the edges of the window still turning black, and that's all the encouraging I need. I drop down and land in the bushes beneath my window. Luckily, the bushes don't have thorns, but hundreds of tiny branches cut through my thick pajamas and slice my skin. Miraculously, I manage to escape with no broken bones, but my left wrist might be sprained. It's starting to swell up and is already turning an ugly color. I roll out of the bush and onto the dewy grass. I look up and hope that I am free, that the darkness is only contained to the house. But my hopes are dashed when I see tendrils of black leaking down the siding underneath the window. I run to the car, and I'm shocked to see that the keys are already in the driver's seat. There's a note underneath them. Had my father planned this? I start up the car and take off down the street deciding that I could wait until I stopped for gas to read it. This is what it said. I am so, so, so sorry. It's time. I don't want it to be, but I can't keep running. I've been running from this thing since my father died 15 years ago, and I was doing a pretty good job at it. But lately I've been so tired. And the darkness. I can hear it when I sleep. And it fills me with such a terror, but it makes me smile. 
I'm scared out of my mind right now. But I'm smiling so wide my head might split in two. The day your mom became pregnant with you, my mother grew pale as a sheet. She gave me a note that my father had written, much like the one you're reading now, explaining everything. My father abandoned me when I was ten, because that was when my grandmother died. You see, this thing originally followed my grandmother, and probably one of my great-grandparents, and so on. And once it got to her, it moved on to my father. My father, rather than subject me to his childhood of moving from city to city with his mother, left us. When I read the note, it was all a joke. Some elaborate excuse for why he had abandoned his family without a single word. I think I just saw a bit of darkness out of the corner of my eye. Which means I must write this quickly. I am scared of the darkness. But I am also eager to see if it fulfills its promises. When you were one, your mother passed away, and it was a terrible shame. I took on raising you by myself, which I thought would be my hardest challenge in life. Boy, was I wrong, huh? We were poor, but happy for about two years. But then my father called me out of the blue. He was blubbering nonsense. At the time, I thought he was drunk. But now I think that he's making perfect sense. He was ready to give in to the darkness, and he wanted to warn me that it would be coming after me next. So get ready, kid. Because now it's your turn. Tag, you're it. I can hear you up in your room moving boxes around. You know that you have to leave tonight. But you don't know yet that it's only going to be you. You'll do well, I think. You're used to this life of constant change. You know the ropes. You don't have any children, so maybe you won't be foolish enough to pass on this wonderful little family curse. I can hear my father. He's calling me to him. I'm going to live with him now. He says we're going to make up for all the time that we missed out on. So goodbye, and good luck. I drop the note to the floorboard with cold, numb fingers. Sobs rack my chest and I bury my head in my hands. My father is gone, and as a parting gift, he has left me the curse. The darkness. I peel out of the gas station and drive away much faster than I should. I feel sorry for my father, and I'm filled with grief because of his passing, but I'm also angry with him. If only he had told me, then I could have helped him. If he had let me help him, then I wouldn't be alone right now. I stop at another gas station four hours later for an energy drink. As I walk towards the store, I see a patch of darkness in the parking lot that is, somehow, untouched by the light that illuminates the pumps. The longer I stare at it, the more mesmerizing it becomes. And then I hear my father's voice, slow and slurred. Come in here with me. We can be together forever. I'm not dead. I'm alive. I promise. Just come into the darkness and we can be together again. I get into my car and drive away quickly, leaving marks on the road outside of the gas station. I don't stop again until morning, when there is more distance between me and the personified darkness that now follows me. My father gave up, but I am stronger than him. I have been coexisting with his curse for a long time. And it will be a long time before it gets the best of me. Except for maybe those illegal black market sites, I never thought any of that dark web shit was real. It's like, oh yeah, that cursed image will totally cause my death if I look at it. Or this video of an unidentified monster attacking people in the forest is definitely real. I'm so sure that stumbling on the wrong page and clicking the wrong link will cause an assassin to show up and take me out. It was funny to me that anyone would actually buy into any of that. My friend Jeff was obsessed with the dark web though. He wasn't trying to score illegal drugs or anything like that, but was convinced some of that spooky crap was real. 
He was always quoting some third or fourth hand account of his cousin's friend's sister's boyfriend being murdered by a ghost girl after reading her suicide note on the dark web. I couldn't help but laugh at how gullible he was to believe those stupid stories. But he was determined to find something he could prove was authentic. Now, after all the shit I gave him for believing, I am going to be the one sitting here telling you some far-fetched story and claiming it is true. Jeff went missing a week ago, and I need any help I can find to figure out how to get him back. Let me tell you the story, and maybe someone will know how to help. I got a text from Jeff on Friday night last week asking me to head over to his place. I was already out and not too far from his place, so I headed over and got there maybe 20 minutes after he'd messaged. He was so excited about showing me something. He opened the door before I even knocked. You have to see this. A guy I know online sent me this link last week. It seemed like some shitty black web stuff at first. Just a collection of unsecured webcam links, but it's actually more than that. I could tell he'd had way too much caffeine and not nearly enough sleep. I'm not into perverted shit, and I didn't think you were either. I was a bit disappointed that Jeff would get into something like that, but he quickly assured me that wasn't the case. No, 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 it's, it's not about spying. I mean, it is about what's on the cameras. But it's not like what you're thinking, just let me show you and explain, okay? I followed him to his desk and a camera feed was pulled up on his monitor. He took a seat and ushered me closer. Okay, take a look and tell me what you see. Well, it looks like there's an intersection, and this camera is pointed at a building on the opposite corner. I took a step toward his desk and looked more closely. Looks like a bank. There are some other buildings around, but the focus is mainly on this bank. Some signs on the side of the road by the camera caught my eye. The street sign says, uh, wait, hold on, that can't be right. Isn't this intersection right down the street? Ding ding ding, that is correct. I've spent the last few days verifying both the location and this is indeed a real-time feed. He pointed to an electronic sign in front of the bank. Right here. It is kind of difficult to make out, but you can see the date and time on the sign in front of the bank. I've been using this to verify there is no looping. The time has been accurate since at least three days ago. That's when I found this feed. Okay, but it's obviously fake. I walked by that intersection on the way here. I kept studying the screen. The bank had thrown me off at first. But slowly the familiar details had begun to stand out. There's no bank on that corner, just a bodega. Why even bother making something like that? A smile was spreading across Jeff's face as I spoke. Right? Now, watch this clip I took of the stream a little while ago. He pulled up a video player that showed the same bank and hit play. There wasn't much going on for the first 20 seconds or so, and then a guy came into view walking along the sidewalk and going past the bank. As he got closer to the corner of the intersection, I realized it wasn't just some random guy. It was me. It was a video of me from just a little while ago when I was walking to get here. The clothes matched and everything. Just so you know, I'm not so weird I would stand by the door for 20 minutes waiting for you. I knew you were coming. Jeff pulled the web browser back up and closed out of the camera feed. Now we were looking at a huge index of camera feeds. Some of them were like our bank feed. Just cameras watching buildings. Some looked like store security cameras and others were personal webcams showing the inside of various homes. I haven't gone through all of them obviously, but I've gone through a number of the cameras that are located outside and I've been able to locate where at least some of them are. I was using Google Street View, so it may just have been outdated, but all the ones I could find were the same as our bank. They are watching some building that isn't actually there. He clicked on one of the feeds to pull it up. This one, for example, is actually just a soccer field when you pulled up on Google Maps. 
Wait, but you saw me on the camera, right? So what happens when some kids go to play on that field? I still thought that this was bullshit, or Jeff was just fucking with me, and was genuinely curious how he'd answer that one. I had the exact same question, so I've been keeping an eye on this camera. Let me show you. Jeff tabbed over to another video and hit play. Some kids in soccer uniforms were walking along in front of the building before turning and walking straight into the side of the building. Once they hit the wall, they just stood there. They just stand like that for a while. Everyone else that comes along did the exact same thing. After like an hour or so, they turn around and walk away like nothing happened. The fuck? They've gotta be in on it. That's the only explanation. Faced with something that didn't make sense, my stubborn brain simply denied it even harder. Yeah, that'd be the obvious explanation. After seeing this, the most reasonable explanation is that these people are somehow in on the act. That's why I had to verify one last thing. Watch this video. I took this one myself. Jeff played another video for me. Okay, here we are, across the intersection from the bodega. Jeff's voice was talking as the camera showed the bodega across the street from him. That is where the bank is in the feed, so the camera is located somewhere on this corner. Based on the location of the street sign, the camera should be right around here. The camera turned from the bodega to the wall behind Jeff. It was a brick wall with nothing on it. No camera. I looked around for a while to be certain, but there was definitely no camera anywhere. I had the feed recording until I got back and confirmed I was looking right at the camera. Jeff was looking at me expectantly. What the hell does that mean? How could there be no camera? I was dumbfounded. The rest I could just deny as being faked somehow. But I knew he wouldn't bullshit me like that. And I had no explanation for how there could be no camera at all. That's when Jeff proposed his plan. I'd like to think maybe my brain was fried from trying to process everything and that's why I went along with something so stupid. But either way, I was a complete idiot for not stopping him. I want to go in there. After everything he'd observed through the feeds in the preceding week, Jeff had begun to theorize that we can interact with the things on the cameras. He referenced the video of the soccer field as an example, and that he thought the kids were in fact touching the building. They just weren't aware because in our world, their physical bodies just passed right through. He wasn't sure what would happen if he managed to get in, and that is why he wanted me here, so at least someone would know if something went wrong. I had just nodded along during his whole spiel, not really knowing what to say. I mean, it couldn't be dangerous because none of this was real, I told myself. He'll go out there, maybe embarrass himself, then we'd have a good laugh and get drunk. His plan was to bring his phone and tablet while I stayed in the apartment. The phone would be to keep in touch with me while streaming video to his desktop, and he'd keep the camera feed open on the tablet. Using the camera feed, he'd try to locate and open the door to the bank and see what happened. Why didn't I stop him? Why did I just sit there and go along with everything? Sure, he'd probably just look like an idiot, but say it was real. What was the worst case scenario? Maybe I am just being too hard on myself in hindsight, but he's fucking gone now, and I can't help blaming myself. Jeff got everything together and set up a mic for me to communicate with him. He had his phone and tablet good to go with some battery packs and a backpack with basic supplies just in case. I came so close to trying to call it off as he was heading out the door, but my damn ego was afraid I'd be the one looking like an idiot. Jeff's voice came through the computer speakers. Alright, I'm heading down the street towards the bodega. I should show up on the feed in a moment. His monitor was split between the camera feed and the stream from his phone, and my eyes were glued to it. It was only a few minutes between when he left and when he showed up on screen. Just don't do anything stupid, Jeff. If this is real, you have no idea what you could be messing with. Yeah, yeah, I know. Don't worry so much. 
Based on the feed, I should be standing right in front of the door. He aimed his phone at some empty space in front of the bodega. I could see his hand reaching out. I don't think I'll be able to feel anything, so I just have to hope I can judge it right. He tried a few times, but nothing seemed to be happening. Maybe I could see a bit better on his monitor than he could on the tablet. But it looked like he was slightly too far to the right. Another moment, I could have stopped all this. But instead, I let him know. Try moving a step to the left. It looks like you are a little off. Ah, yeah. Okay, I think you're right. A few more tries and I thought maybe he'd give up. It looked like he was either really close or was right on it, but it wasn't working. Damn, maybe you're right, and it is fake. I swear my hand is right on... Wait. He pointed the camera on his phone directly at his hand that looked to be grasping nothing. He slowly pulled it toward him, and a line of light as if a door in a dark room was opening to a brightly lit hallway appeared. Holy shit! Oh my fucking fuck! Dude, it's real! It's real! Oh my god, my heart won't stop racing. I finally found it! Something I can prove is real! And those were the last words I heard him speak. Even going back over the video from his phone in slow motion, it is impossible to tell what it actually was. But something came out of the light and grabbed Jeff. I heard a shrill scream before his phone fell to the ground and I just barely caught a glimpse of the light disappearing before the feed cut. I couldn't move for a long time. At least a few hours went by before I finally managed to go retrieve his phone. When I found it outside the bodega, there was no other sign that my friend had been there. The phone didn't work anymore, and the back was seared where something scorching hot had burned it. I haven't left his apartment since. I've been watching the camera for any sign of him, but I have yet to see anything happen. None of this has reappeared, and nothing has gone in or out of the bank. What do I do now? What happened to Jeff? I'm too scared to go outside. I used to visit death-themed subreddits like Watch People Die and Morbid Curiosity very regularly. I don't know why, but I've always been drawn to that kind of stuff. Horror movies, real-life stories, it all fascinates me. I wish I had looked away because there are some things you just can't unsee. I remember one video in particular. A man is cut in half by a train. His legs severed and viscera scattered. Well, he miraculously and horribly remains alive for a few minutes waiting for death. That one really got me. Not just the carnage inflicted on the poor man. But the fact that a huge group of bystanders did nothing but film him. No one offered comfort. No one held his hand. Maybe that's why, when I was faced with a similar situation, I acted how I did. I was walking back to my office building near the end of my lunch break, after getting a sandwich at a local deli. The weather was a perfect spring day, blue sky with a slight breeze, and the scent of the ocean on the air. The tranquility was shattered by the screech of tires, the sound of metal on metal, and the most horrendous screams I've ever heard. I quickly saw the source. A bicyclist had been hit by a truck and was lying half-crushed on the side of the street. Everyone around was in similar shock, and it was like we all took a collective moment for our brains to catch up to what we were seeing. Suddenly, with the speed of an elastic band snapping back, time moved normally again, and people began calling for 911, directing traffic, clearing the scene. But no one approached the man. In that instant, I remembered the video, I knew what I had to do, and before I could think I rushed to the victim's side. To say it was the worst thing I've ever seen is a gross understatement. The man's intestines were spilling out of a gash that nearly severed him in two. One of his legs was a pulp of red, and the smell, god, the smell was unfathomable. As I approached I saw that my fear was confirmed. 
he was conscious. Imagine knowing you're mortally injured, aware that you are living the last few moments of your life. It's not a fate I would wish on anyone, so I did what I could. I knelt by his side, careful not to look at his injuries more than necessary. His eyes were huge, with pupils blown out and the whites rolling like a wild horse's. As he saw me, he stilled a little and reached for me with his working arm. I murmured as I clasped his hand. I'm here, I've got you. I didn't know what else to say in that moment. He stared at me and his labored breathing slowed a little. Am I going to die? He rasped, blood frothing in the corner of his lip. I couldn't lie and I couldn't give him false hope. We both knew the truth. Yeah, but you have nothing to be scared of. You're going where we all end up, eventually. I know this isn't what you want, but you're going on a new adventure. I tried to make my words even and calm, stroking the back of his hand. After that, we were silent, him broken and prone on the pavement, me his sentinel, cradling his hand in mine. The whole while I prayed for his end to come quickly. Mercifully, he passed soon after. Before the sirens of the approaching ambulance could even be heard, the paramedics found me still sitting with them, and when they took over I quickly stumbled away and threw up the sandwich I'd eaten earlier. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Witnessing his last breath, but I knew it had been the right thing. I called him to work shortly after and let my boss know what had happened. He was suitably appalled and told me to take as much time as I needed. To be honest, I don't remember my commute home or even how I got to my car in the first place. I stumbled into my apartment and got right into a hot shower, clothes and all, thinking only of washing the man's blood off. When I emerged later, scrubbed pink and feeling more exhausted than I ever had, I had only thoughts of sleeping for a long while. I moved slowly, like cold syrup, and entered my bedroom, flicking on the lights. There on my bed was a beautifully wrapped gift box. In hindsight, I should have been more worried, knowing that no one had access to my apartment. But in that moment, my brain was functioning at little more than static frequency. Puzzled, I carefully removed the shiny ebony paper. A cold chill seemed to seep from the box, and I opened it to reveal a massive onyx fabric. Extricating it fully from the box, I held it up, revealing a long hooded cloak, the color of darkest midnight. It was then that I saw the card. In delicate calligraphy, it only said five words, for a job well done. Despite how it may appear, this is not a story about death. This is a story about free will. The weeks following the accident passed in a blur. I couldn't sleep and ended up with a prescription for some chemical aid, which succeeded in numbing my mind and blunting the edge of reality. For days, I didn't bathe and existed in a fog interrupted by tasteless meals and even more tasteless daytime TV. The cloak was put into the closet, crammed into the back by the leftover Christmas wrapping paper and spare linens, where it sat forgotten. After a month in a purgatory of grief and shock, I finally emerged and rejoined the living. Work resumed. I cautiously started going out with friends, and life moved on for a time, although my mind never strayed too far from what I'd witnessed that day on the street. I was processing it, and slowly but surely I was coming to peace. It was about 12 weeks later that all of my progress came grinding to a violent halt. Again, it was a beautiful sunny day, birds chirping and not a single cloud in the sky. As I sip my coffee on the patio, I saw that the apartment groundskeeper was about to do some mowing. I sat and watched him work, 
idly thinking about my own tasks for the day ahead. I reached for my coffee, savoring the morning. When my left hand suddenly went numb, it felt like it had been dipped into ice water, pins and needles dancing across my flesh. I stood up suddenly, knocking into my patio table in my haste, looking for a source of the chill. At that moment, I saw the groundskeeper from the corner of my eye, pushing the mower. Between one step and the next, he suddenly went stiff. A marionette with all his strings pulled taut. My hand forgotten, I turned just in time to see him collapse in the grass. The bird song stopped, along with everything else. In slow motion, I watched blades of grass float to the ground and my discarded coffee cup seemed to be suspended in the air. Like a wave crashing, time caught up suddenly. The cacophony of noise from the nearby streets punctuated by the smash of my mug on the patio floor. In the span of a heartbeat, I was outside and beside the collapsed man. A neighbor had also seen him fall, and I could hear him on the phone with emergency dispatch. But one look at the groundskeeper and I knew it was too late. So once more I found myself holding the hand of a man struggling through the last moments of his life. He clutched at his chest, frantically trying to draw breath, while I supplicated, knees and grass clippings, praying for his peace. He gripped my hand tighter, eyes metronome ticking between mine and the ring in his left hand. The truth of the situation seeming to settle in, he tried desperately to tell me something. It came out as a near whisper, impossible to decipher. I'll tell her you love her, but she already knows. From the wedding band on his finger, I guessed at what he was trying to say. Tears pooled in his eyes, but he nodded. The pleading look replaced by something closer to acceptance. Focus on your love. She can feel it. I took a deep breath, my own tears choking my voice. My words seemed to be lulling him, though, and a faint smile had appeared on his lips. Just think of all the stories you'll have to tell her when you see each other again. His eyes closed slowly like a setting sun, and his chest stilled, while my hand, still clasped in his, Gave another flare of icy cold. He was gone. Later, after the paramedics had been and went, and the crowd of neighbors had dispersed like carrion crows called home, I was again alone in my apartment. Although my hand had returned to a normal temperature, a hot shower was needed. Like after the first incident, I was numb. I guess death is cold. As the scolding water rained down on me, I couldn't stop my mind from going over the events of the two deaths I'd now borne witness to. The scenes looping, replaying in tandem, reflecting the fragility of life. I was not okay. I was deeply affected by what I had been involved in, but I also knew that if given a do-over, I would make the same choices again, to be there for those last moments so they wouldn't be alone. When I finally stepped from the tub, the bathroom was thick with fog. The mirror obscured by film. I blindly reached for a towel, but my hands settled on an unfamiliar fabric hanging from the rack. The inky black cloak was no longer tucked away in the closet. After witnessing the second man's passing, I was understandably checked out. Laughter was a memory. Happiness, a whispered rumor. I was scared to go outside lest I be in the wrong place at the wrong time again. Although I was honored to have been able to hopefully bring a modicum of comfort to the men I'd seen pass. My mental state was suffering. I began getting headaches. Ice picks driven deep behind my eyes. The only cure being isolation in a dark, silent room. My friends, despite my protests, were determined not to let me waste away behind closed doors. They brought care packages, kept me updated on the lives of mutual acquaintances, 
and even drove me to doctor's appointments. While I took a sabbatical from work and tried to find relief from my headaches, I was hounded constantly by the thought of the black hooded cloak. I hadn't moved it from the towel rack in the bathroom. The thought of even touching it too much for me to take on in my admittedly fragile state. One Sunday I awoke inexplicably determined to get some fresh air into my lungs, so I ventured out to the beach near my house. Overwhelmed by the prospect of crowds, I ensured I arrived early and claimed a spot in the shade under a beautiful willow tree. I nestled into my blanket, closed my eyes, and let the sounds of the gently lapping waves drift over me. It was the most peaceful I'd felt since everything had happened. I don't know how long I lay there, in the magical place between sleep and wakefulness, blessedly free from headaches. When I finally fully awoke, the sun was high in the sky. And although my patch of shade had shrunk and I could feel the beginnings of a sunburn, my left hand tingled with a chill. I've never understood the saying, my blood ran cold, until that moment. I knew without a doubt that I was about to witness another death. My mind raced as I considered running. My self-preservation panicked at the thought that this was no longer something I could chalk up to coincidence. But it was too late. A woman's voice, tentative at first, began calling for her child. The woman's calls quickly became more frantic and soon others had taken up the call as well. I stood up from my blankets, eyes pulled to the horizon, where a small shape was barely discernible amongst the waves. I could have alerted someone else, but I knew this was my task alone. Like the inevitability of death, I had begun to accept what was happening. I sprinted to the water and plunged in, thankful for my years spent swimming as I quickly covered the distance to the child. By now, others had seen where I was heading and were attempting to catch up and help, but I was the first to arrive by a large margin, as I knew I would be. When I reached the little girl, I saw that she was small, no older than eight or nine, her long blonde hair streaming around her like a mermaid. Her blue eyes were open, and as I reached for her she slipped under the water. I dove down, her gaze locking with mine as I followed her towards the sandy bottom of the ocean. She had already gone still, no longer thrashing, her hands delicately floating in front of her in a graceful arc of ballerina's pose. Now parallel and eye to eye. I took her small fingers in my numb left hand, and the air left her lungs in a final cloud of tiny, perfect bubbles. I could swear I heard her sigh. For a few heartbeats we swayed together under the surface, the quiet calm a private refuge from the chaos I knew was occurring above. When I finally broke the surface, bringing her up with me, a crowd of other swimmers were there to help pull her to shore. Although it was too late. A few people attempted to resuscitate her on the beach, seeing all I had needed to, and knowing there was nothing more to do, I stumbled away to the tree, forgotten by the other rescuers and the hysterical mother, now weeping over her child's slight frame. I collapsed on my blanket, unable to move or form a cohesive thought, slowly with infinite tenderness, a warmth settled around me. Looking down at myself, I saw that the black cloak had been draped around my shoulders. I whirled around, desperate to see who had wrapped it around me, to finally identify the gift giver, who had been my near constant cause of fear for the last few months. No one was there, and no footprints marred the sand behind me. With raised hair and on the verge of a panic attack, I all but fled back to my home determined to check myself into a psychiatric facility, or a church, as soon as possible. At home, I hung the cloak up in the entryway, unaware as to why I hadn't left it behind. I was about to call a friend for help when I saw that I had a voicemail on my phone. It was the doctor's office, asking me to come in to discuss the results of my recent MRI. I knew then 
without having to fear the diagnosis that it was something bad. The next day, the events at the beach put aside while I attended a meeting at the hospital brought sobering news. The cause of my headaches, although something I had tried to shrug off as inconsequential, was in fact an inoperable tumor. The prognosis, stiffly delivered by a non-flinching specialist, gave me an expiry date akin to that of a carton of milk. There was a lot of talk about keeping me comfortable, and about decisions I would need to make, but there is one decision I must make before any others. When I arrived home, still in shock from the death sentence I was handed, a letter was waiting for me on my Krondunzu. The beautiful calligraphy, written in the same hand as the original card accompanying the cloak, bedecked the envelope addressed to me by name. With shaking fingers, I began to read. Death has never been the end, and as yours is approaching, you must decide. Will you wear the cloak? The choice, as always, is yours. So here I sit, my laptop the only illumination in my room, the cloak now draped across my bed. I have decisions to make. Whoever you are, this letter has found you for a reason. By now you know my story, and have likely compared it to the pages of your own. I wish I had had more time. Time to discuss it with you, to hear your thoughts, to ask how you'll react when you're called forth. Maybe it will be me who delivers your cloak, and I wonder what your choice will be when the time comes. Whatever you decide, I hope this last account will help you determine your path. As always, the choice is yours. It's strange, the things that come to mind when one contemplates their impending end. I thought I would have sat mournful over the places I had not traveled, the people I'd missed the most, but instead, one quote in particular kept playing over in my mind. Like a song on the radio that I couldn't escape, in the words of John Keats. For many a time, I have been half in love with easeful death. I wondered, as I prepared to meet him, if I would indeed love death my mysterious benefactor and shadow. There was a nobility in the way I pictured him, unmoving, endless, and quiet. I tried to picture the after, and I found it was like trying to imagine a new, unseen color. Despite my attempt to pry answers from the cloak's giver, none had appeared. I had written a return message on the letter left for me, but in the morning, no new words had been penned. The uncertainty was the hardest part. If I accepted the cloak, I had somewhat of an idea of what my eternity would entail, joining the ranks of reapers, ferrymen, and guides. I wondered idly which of the myths were closest to the truth. I wondered at the enormity of it. The possibility haunted me, however, that taking up this mantle would exclude me from the end which all others experience. What if, at the end of the lighted tunnel, a paradise awaited from which I would be barred entry? What if my loved ones were forever waiting on the other side, and eternity spent wondering why I had not appeared? Somewhat cruelly, I had been given a reprieve from the headaches, but the time bomb in my head remained. At least my mobility had returned, and I was able to once again leave my apartment in an attempt to enjoy the time I had left. Those attempts were futile, as my role as witness to death had increased in frequency. I was no longer presented with only the passing of humans. As I walked around the neighborhood one night, a pitiful mew, combined with the familiar tingling in my left hand, drew my attention. Under a towering cedar hedge lay a small black and white cat, mercifully free from blood. Playing my part by rote, I approached and knelt by the animal, and tentatively reached out to stroke its satiny fur. Its ribs were easily felt, 
its body withered by old age. The cat calmed almost instantly, nuzzling into the chill of my fingers. And for the first time since all of this had begun, I wasn't scared. There was an undeniable honor in this gift, or curse. When the cat had stilled, and my hand once again began to warm, I placed its nearly weightless body in a small grave I had dug under the cedar. It was such a stark contrast to the commotion that accompanies human death. To be silent and alone. No sirens wail. No tears or cries or frantic shouts. It was beautiful. A bird with a broken back, shattered upon my window, a dog struck by a careless driver and left behind like discarded trash, a moth, wings frail from a too short life spent chasing flames. All of them sought me, and I in turn was drawn to their ebbing light, entombed safely within my home, a husk unable to venture out. I regretted that they would not be able to find me. I hoped someone else would comfort them when needed. My lungs struggled, while my heart trudged doggedly on with my Trojan horse chest. Hopes and secrets and all the things left unsaid, guarded safely behind my ribs. I wish I had saved my voice for something important. A grand last statement but it was as though all of my remaining strength had pulled within my cold left hand. I knew that my friends and family could trust in my love for them. I left behind no large estate to be settled, nor children left bereft. Compared to many, my death was easy and uncomplicated. My thoughts shifted, machine gun rapid, between I'm fine, I'm at peace with this, I'm ready, I'm... And, please, I'm scared. I don't want to go. I'm sorry. I wish I had done more, seen more, and been more. Please don't let me go. I don't want to go. Don't forget me when I'm gone. Don't let me be a half-remembered name, set only out of obligation and false grief. I don't want to be alone. I can't. I took a deep breath, pulled through lips pressed tight with stubborn resolve lending strength to dug in heels, still fighting against my end. I regretted not leaving my phone within reach, not seeking hospice care, not asking someone, anyone, to sit with me and talk me through it, to talk me out. Gently a hand clasped mine. I looked up from my bed, unable to move my head much, my muscles as pliant as a newborn calf's, and was struck by the way the black cloak he wore seemed to absorb all of the light in the room. He was taller than I thought, which brought me to near hysterical laughter, the absurdity of the moment too much to bear. Hello, I whispered, as my gaze shifted to where his eyes might have been concealed within the abyss of his cloak's hood. For an eternity he was silent, his hand cold in mine, the chill oscillating between our fingers, dancing, becoming acquainted. Have you made a decision? Will you wear it? His voice was a breeze through a cornfield, the crackling of burning wood. His right hand motioned to the cloak I was given, pooled at the end of my bed. I tried once more to weigh the options, but my mind was consumed by the enormity of the moment. I felt as though I might fall off the earth, plunging into the cold vacuum of the universe. The thread which tethered me there was fraying. I felt light. I felt the strands connecting me to everything else. The force between all living things. I was breathing in the stars and they were breathing me back. I was right. There was nothing to fear. It was beautiful. My answer was a single nod. And with that we were floating. The cloak around me. Its edges blended with his. We were on ending. I was ready. You made the right choice. He said. 
voice strong and clear, as he pulled back his hood, and we began. I write to you from my childhood cafe. It is the only place I've ever truly felt safe. The hole I have dug for myself in this life has become so deep I can no longer climb out. I only pray you will pay heed to my words. One summer when I was young and bored, I thought I would toy with the mind. I delved into meditation and would practice in the many hours I had to kill. I could hone my mind with such precision that I nearly frightened myself. Searching for more, I played with the realm of sleep. Somehow I didn't want much to do with lucid dreaming, and instead quickly became obsessed with astral projection. Many people don't believe in the ability to leave your body, but I did. Maybe it's not so strange. A young girl just entering puberty would seek a method of escape. I blame other things on that youthful immaturity, like my ignorance. It wasn't that I believed nothing could hurt me, it was that I believed I could protect myself. I'd done my research, but I was meek. And so I practiced. Every day I'd put my body to sleep and keep my mind awake and try, nearly beg my consciousness to slip out. Sometimes I felt close, mostly I didn't. Then one day it happened. No, there was no grand departure. Instead, it first became dark. My eyes were closed, mind you, so it was already pitch black. But this dark wasn't an absence. It was a presence in itself. Then there was pressure. I thought perhaps it was sleep paralysis, but I soon realized this pressure wasn't on my chest or abdomen. It was on my mind, on my consciousness. It was stifling. I couldn't think only react internally, and I began to descend. Do you know that feeling of falling off a skyscraper right before you fall asleep, followed by violently jerking awake? It was that, but I never woke up. The falling began to feel like pulling, while this pressure threatened not to suffocate, but to shatter me. I thought I was dying. It felt as though I was being driven into the core of the earth, and with the intensifying summer heats, I would have believed it if my mother did not come wake me up. I stared, uneasy but immediately relieved of what seemed to be my impending doom. We were renovating. Well, only in my room. You see, my sister had outgrown her crib. It was time for a bunk bed. I'd had the same bed since I was about six years old, so it was like saying goodbye to an old friend. But it was also refreshing. I initially thought nothing of my old set sitting outside in pieces, but as the sun began to set on the new wooden tower residing in my room, something felt wrong. I scanned every niche from the doorway, unsure. There's a certain dread, an instinctual anxiety wired into us that goes off when something is just not right. Now my entire room felt that way. Every single time I walked in, even now, I can only describe what began in my room and that something was disturbed. I'm not sure what or why exactly, but it did not like the change of switching beds. And it only got worse. I couldn't stand to be alone in my room for very long, especially at night. I drew my curtains, shut my closet, and trained myself to sleep only facing the wall. I put salt on my windows tried imagining myself surrounded by a bright white light, which was especially difficult. It was always so dim or would flicker. I even tried talking out loud to whatever was there, telling it I wouldn't stand to be afraid. I wasn't overly religious, but my grandmother was, so I took her Bible and slept with it under my pillow for two weeks. It provided brief solace but whatever was there was pending behind that thin line. My family thought I was overreacting. Even I wondered if I was. This continued for the rest of my summer into the beginning of the school year, and it intensified until my room was almost audibly throbbing with this presence. 
Then the voices began. I woke up one morning for school, having shut my alarm off. I lay there, physically lethargic but mentally alert. I felt the same dread, and thought to myself, it's always there. And it answered me. Of course it's there. The most inhuman, guttural growl I have ever heard muttered directly into my ear. This was followed by a heat radiating over my face, as if it had a breath. Facing the wall, I did not turn around. It said other things, placing a sickening coyness behind its voice. But from that first response, it was as though I was in a trance, completely numb to the ordeal. I heard the commotion of the early morning in my household, and got up to follow suit. Only later in the day did I experience some kind of delayed fearful response. An internet search turned up hypnopompic hallucinations, those which occur upon awakening. It was nice to think that it was as innocent as that, but I am here writing to you. Thus this period of my life was marked by what many would deem a psychotic episode. I began to hear that voice occasionally during the day interjecting a thought or conversation I was having. This was all accompanied by constant physical and emotional lethargy, depression, and paranoia. There was incessant movement in my peripheral vision. Walking home was sometimes torturous. I would repeatedly catch something in the corners of my eyes. Too short to be a lamp post, too tall to be a human. Nights became darker and I could never stay up until 3 in the morning. Yet I never came face to face with a damn thing. Maybe that's for the better. Maybe I couldn't have handled it. When I finally broke, this episode ended as quickly as it came. I was taking a nap in the middle of the day one weekend, having a nightmare. I don't even remember exact details, just that I was being chased. There was the normal escalation of a night terror, and at its climax I jolted awake. But my dream still pursued me. It seemed like sleep paralysis again, but whatever had caught me in the dream now had me by the head. It was so strong, and I felt that familiar pressure as it shoved me farther into my pillow. It seemed to be whispering, but I soon realized there were several indiscernible whispers, and they began to grow louder. The whole incident was so much more corporeal than the last. I couldn't breathe. My head was nearly in pain. The whispers were maddening. I was sure it was going to crush my skull, and in a desperate moment I began to pray. Again, I wasn't really religious. I believed in God passively because it was instilled into me, but I attached little to the name. Yet in that moment, the whispers died down as the grip loosened. The whole thing was over remarkably fast. I sat up and cried. Then I began attending church with my grandmother. I never told her or anyone a word of this. I couldn't even be sure it wasn't some sort of placebo. But I didn't really care. One by one, my plagues left me. No more lethargy. No more clouds perpetually hanging over me. No more suspicious movement just out of my line of sight. I was cured. In fact, I didn't really think much about it for years. I was still wary, of course. If I got a bad vibe from a location, I avoided it. If people mentioned exploring the paranormal, I counted myself out. It was behind me. I grew up, experienced the ups and downs of life. I kept my faith. I'm not sure what got into me. I guess you could say life did. One too many straws, a dead father, a lost job, a tarnished marriage. I cursed at the sky, spat upon the church, and abandoned my community to wallow in my misery alone. We both know you have your regrets. Of mine, this is my ultimate. I regret it more than the first attempt to project many summers ago. Last night I dreamed of that long, gone bunk bed in my old dreadful room. I was laying down, 
albeit restlessly. Getting up to draw my curtains and shut my closet door, I became lightheaded, as the entire room moved much like a descending elevator. I think there is something waiting for me. Perhaps it will be sitting patiently on the edge of my bed when I get home. But this time, in this hole I've dug so deep, there is no one to call upon, and no one to cast a rope. Last night started off pretty normal. Most of the downstairs lights were off when I got home, but that was to be expected. Mary doesn't mean to do it, but she always seems to forget that her husband works the graveyard shift, meaning he will be coming home most nights when both she and the son are fast asleep. It was nothing to be angry about though. I simply planned to bust her for her constant forgetfulness the next morning and nothing more. Anyways, I hadn't eaten anything in the last few hours. So, rather than going straight to bed like I always do, I decided to pop a frozen pizza into the microwave, just to silence my growling stomach. That break of routine, as meaningless as it seemed at the time, is probably the only reason I am writing this post. Once I opened the beeping microwave, I saw that the clock read 2.49am. I almost regretted staying up to eat this pizza and I truly could feel my eyelids getting heavier with each second. Rather than move to the table to eat, I ate right in front of the microwave. I or Mary could clean up any mess in the morning. I just wanted to get some food in me and get some rest before I had to follow the same tiring schedule all over again the next day. From where I was eating, my front door was roughly 90 degrees to my left, and only about 15 feet away. I could see my front door and the small window beside it if I was looking that way. But at that point I wasn't focused on anything other than devouring my pizza. Out of the corner of my eye I noticed that the motion lights had just unexpectedly turned out. Other than being surprised, I didn't pay much attention to it at that time. We live in a pretty wooded area and get animals moving around through our yard all the time. I was sure that whatever was out there was nothing of note. Maybe a badger or something of the like. After a minute, the lights clicked back off. I assumed that whatever had triggered them must have been scared off immediately by the lights. I returned my focus to my pizza. Once I was done eating, I dragged myself to the stairs with what little energy I had left in my body. To get to the stairs, you have to walk into the front entryway and pass by the front windows. Without thinking, I take a look out of my front window and was immediately jolted awake, and as my heart pounded like it was going to leap out of my chest, standing in my yard about 20 feet away from my door was a man. Well, the outline of what seemed to be a man. There are no street lights on our street, so the only lights in our yard were the motion lights we installed when we moved in which, as I mentioned, were off, and the dim light we keep on in the entryway radiating out of the front windows to the yard. All I could see was this outline, with head craned upwards, as if they were looking to the stars or something. I didn't really know what to do. It was a freaky sight to see, but we live in a small town and secluded community. We know literally everyone that lives around us, and our neighbors are all very trustworthy people. I figured that this person was someone I knew, so I tapped on the window to get the person's attention. Foolish, I know. Wasn't really thinking clearly, I guess. But anyway, I didn't want to wake Mary, so I tried to stay as quiet as possible. He didn't budge. No reaction at all. I figured that whoever it was out there couldn't hear me, so... I opened the door. Don't get it twisted. I was scared beyond belief, but at the end of the day, I try to see the best in people. The figure in my yard hadn't really done anything to warrant a phone call to the police. Plus, they usually take a good 10 minutes to answer a call out here. I hope to resolve this quickly and cleanly. As the door creaked open, I realized that the figure had changed slightly. He was now staring right at me. It was jarring. 
Two seconds prior when looking out the window, he'd still been staring upwards. I couldn't make out the finer points of his features yet, as the light from my house barely reached him, and I thought that made him all the more creepy. The figure just slowly started to walk backwards towards the road while still facing me. As the person sped up slightly, the motion lights finally came back on. He wasn't anyone I had ever seen before. He was relatively tall, six foot four maybe, and crazy skinny. Borderline emaciated, really. He truly looked like he had never eaten anything a day in his life, and he was completely hairless. No eyebrows, no facial hair, and bald. I was speechless as the seemingly mute and sickly person just silently observed me, and I quickly realized that he was less terrifying when he was obscured by shadows. He turned and ran away from me through my yard, across the road and into the woods on the other side of the road. I was frozen in fear. Neither fight nor flight kicked in for me. Had this person wanted to hurt me or Mary, he had his chance, but he didn't take it. I locked the door and went upstairs not really sure of what to do. I couldn't really have called the police once he was gone, could I? I mean this guy didn't really do anything. Sure he was on private property, but I'm sure the police wouldn't take it seriously. I figured it was useless, and that I'd rather keep my guard up in case this man came back tonight and worry about possibly phoning the police. I got very little sleep. I was sure that every rustle of the leaves or every gust of wind was the trespasser returning. I finally shut my eyes at 6am when the sun started to rise but was up when I heard Mary shuffling to the shower at 8ish. Oh, good morning. Didn't expect you to be up. Aren't you sleepy? Yeah, but I couldn't really sleep. Tough night of work and all that. Since I'm up, why don't I make you some breakfast before you go to work? She smiled and nodded in appreciation. I wanted to tell her about the events from a few hours prior, but I knew it would freak her out. And why wouldn't it? It was a terrifying turn of events. I don't know. I thought maybe her favorite dish of bacon and eggs would make the news easier for her. Really dumb logic in hindsight. But I guess I was still experiencing a fear-induced shock. What are we going to do? Mary was trying to be calm, but I knew by the fact that she ignored her breakfast after I explained the situation that she was freaked out. I told her there wasn't really much for us to do right now. We argued a little bit, and she made it clear that she really wanted to call the police. I still didn't think it was a good idea. We had zero evidence to prove anyone was in our yard last night. Zilch, or so I thought. What about those cameras that Mrs. Maddox installed? Didn't you link them up to your laptop when we moved in or something? We moved in about five years ago because, even though it was the middle of nowhere, the house was actually a bit closer to both of our jobs. And honestly, we liked the privacy the community offered. We bought the house from Jason Maddox, whose mother was an old widower living there alone for a few years. She had been petrified of the neighborhood ever since the death of her husband. Her son sold the house on her behalf so that she could live with them, hopefully living out the final years of her life in peace with Jason and his wife and kids. Before she moved out, she had Jason install a few cameras outside her house, just to provide her a peace of mind. The things were cheap pieces of junk, and Jason himself said they rarely looked at them, but it turns out they actually came in more handy than any of us could have ever imagined. I shrugged. I guess you're the brains in this relationship after all, Mare. I'll call the boys in blue and deal with them and the cameras before I head off for work. In the meantime, do me a favor and don't get too upset about all this. That was easier said than done. But I think she was a lot calmer once I started to take her police suggestions seriously. I kissed her goodbye and got right to work on figuring things out. I poured myself a coffee and got to work. I was half expecting the bastards not to work in their hour of need because of my half decade of neglect. But thankfully I couldn't have been more wrong. I opened the software, 
and after a 15-ish minutes of updates, I finally saw a live feed of the four different cameras of my outside. The camera in the driveway was angled poorly to the point where you could only see a small sliver of the driveway and dense foliage, while the back and side cameras showed mostly foliage and the fenced-in portion of our yard. Jason Maddox had unsurprisingly done a piss poor job setting up 75% of the cameras. The front camera was a comparative mecca for our home surveillance. From what I could tell from watching the live feed, this camera was angled perfectly to have captured our uninvited visitor. I went into the database and found last night's camera feeds. Sure enough, at 2.54am, the man crept out from the shadows and into our front yard. There it was. Concrete, undeniable proof. I called and alerted the police. And they took me very seriously once I told them I had video evidence of the intruder. The operator said that two officers would be sent to my home to view last night's video and file a police report. Alas, my relief was short-lived. Something that the operator said made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. A logical and seemingly mundane question with immense ramifications. Something both horrifying and entirely possible that I simply hadn't thought of. Does this individual show up on the security cameras any other nights? All at once, I realized how entirely possible and downright terrifying this possibility was. I mean, how many times did I lay awake in bed and see the front lights click on at odd hours of the night? Like I said, it was a pretty regular occurrence for us. I immediately checked the feed from the night before I encountered the man face to face. I wasn't sure when he might come, so I started at 9pm. I played it at 2 times speed and made it through the night without anything of note. Momentary relief. I went back one more night prior. At 12.36am, he creeps into the yard and triggers the front motion lights. I was stunned. But it got even worse. He stayed there, motionless, in complete darkness until just about 5 a.m. He was so still for almost five hours that he didn't even trigger the motion lights again until he turned around and left for the day. Think about that. While our motion lights aren't very sensitive, I know for a fact that something as simple as a head jerk from a sneeze would set them off. This guy was essentially a statue for almost five hours. As I'm writing this, I am shaken. The police arrived moments after I made my discovery. I told the two officers about the new development, and they were visibly uncomfortable. Sergeant James, the veteran between the two officers, would later tell me that he never saw anything like this in his almost 23 years on the job. We went through 33 days of video logs, and found that the man had come to my home on 27 of those nights. Besides the nights I interrupted him, his briefest stay lasted 22 minutes and 15 seconds which was five days ago. His longest day occurred early last week. He arrived at 11.57pm and left at 6.13am. He always stands in a similar spot in the front yard, about 20 feet from the front door. I called in sick for work tonight, because I can't begin to describe how little I want Mary to be alone at this house when night falls. I'm terrified. So are the cops. Especially since they don't have this person for much. So far all the evidence shows is trespassing and loitering on private property. If they were to catch him in the act, and not find any reason to charge him with a more serious crime, he'd probably just get a fine or a brief stint in jail. They claim they'll have patrol cars scouring the area tonight, and one car stationed in front of my house all night, which makes me feel somewhat better. But their lack of answers and their obvious uneasiness about all this makes me extremely nervous. That's all I have for now. Mary comes home in an hour, and it will be dark soon. If anyone knows anything about this situation, or just has a theory or spot to detail I missed, please let me know in the comments. I will update you all when we learn more about the whole situation, or if something of note occurs. Until then, let's just hope we make it through the night tonight. Thank you to everyone who expressed their concern for my wife and I. 
Between all of your kind words and the kindness of the police, it's nice knowing we aren't alone through all this craziness. Fortunately, our night was mostly uneventful, after all the bizarre discoveries from the previous day. At least one police car stayed parked in the front of our house from sundown until sunup, just as was promised. And there were no signs of the mysterious individual through the whole night. I know it's quite possible he could have been present somewhere else. But you take solace in the little victories when you can get them. At two-ish, I heard the policemen moving around in the driveway. In the morning, they told me they thought they saw the person standing in the driveway. But by the time they investigated the driveway and the wooded area near it, there was no sign of the trespasser. I also appreciate hearing all your suggestions in the comments about how to get through these times of trouble. I'm not a superstitious man, but I definitely can't rule anything you suggested out at this point. After doing some research about wendigos and skinwalkers, I can say I'm thoroughly terrified by the similarities our visitor had with both of them. I sure as hell hope that our guest wasn't either of those things. Otherwise, this all seems pretty hopeless. Also, I do own a shotgun. I've never used it for anything other than skeet shooting, but having it definitely makes me feel a little safer. I'll be sure to keep it locked, loaded, and by my side until everything is resolved. Anyways, there have been some developments since last night, which I will share with you all now. For starters, I've decided not to tell Mary about the fact that our guest is a reoccurring visitor to our property. I told her that the police stayed out front all night as a favor to us, rather than their fear that we're dealing with something a lot more malicious than just a one-time trespasser. Plus, I'm worried that this might bring back some bad memories for her. She had an issue with a stalker when she was in college, and it persisted for nearly a year before she was able to get a restraining order on him. Even though she hasn't seen this person since, she's still very much disturbed by that painful experience eight years later. I spent most of last night trying to convince her to make the trip to stay at her sister's, but she refuses to leave me alone despite how unsafe our house now is. I'm walking on eggshells here. So while withholding the truth from her feels dirty, I think it's better than the alternative if she's sticking here with me. I also made a trip to town around 9 o'clock this morning to make a few purchases that should let any upcoming nights feel a little safer. The most important purchase, 15 lights that are much stronger than the ones we've had dotting our property since we moved in. These new lights are set on a timer, so I plan to illuminate just about every inch of property starting tonight. I also made a stop to my friend Andrew's house after my shopping spree. He's on the road for work right now, but since he's been an avid hunter his whole life, I knew he had something that could really up my surveillance factor. Game cameras. If you're not familiar, game cameras are cameras used mostly by hunters that are most often triggered by either sound or motion. Andrew's three game cameras were older and were only able to take still frames when triggered. But I think it's important to monitor the woods surrounding my house as well as my property. The more information I can gather on this... person, the better chance we have of getting our life back to normal. After making these stops, I got back home around noon to both set up for another tense night and to continue to find answers on who it was visiting our house. It took an hour, but I readjusted all four cameras. I'm not very handy at all. And the three I had to unscrew and remount kept falling off no matter how much I tried to screw them into place. But, thanks to my efforts, I have a much better view of the entire property of the area surrounding my house. I really don't think I'll see much on the two cameras in the fenced-in parts of our property out back, as the back fence is tall and all that can be seen behind the fence on camera are the dense trees. But you never know what could happen. What feels much more useful now is the driveway camera, which finally actually shows every inch of the driveway. Since the cops may have seen a figure in the driveway, I wouldn't be shocked if I now caught this trespasser thanks to the new angle as well. I also picked three spots in the woods to set up Andrew's motion-activated game cameras as well. Since these cameras are older technology, I won't be able to see the stills they take until I retrieve them and download their images the next morning. Well, it's a little after 4pm as I'm writing this, and I want to look through the older logs of the camera again. 
I'd like to go back to the earliest recordings from when Mrs. Maddox was still living here, to see if I could find any evidence of the trespasser showing up all those years ago as well. I doubt it though, since Jason or Mrs. Maddox herself would have noticed if they checked the cameras regularly like they claimed. But I figure it pays to check. I'll post any updates if I find anything of note. Updates. Yeah, he's in the videos from eight years ago. I looked through the first three nights recorded by the camera, and so far this bastard has shown up in their front yard each night. He hasn't done anything different in these videos, though. Obviously, this is an important finding, since it proves that the Maddox family might know something, but it doesn't really teach me anything more about who or what I'm dealing with. I'm going to call Jason and see if I could talk to his mom now. She was so high strung. She had to have noticed this person at some point. I called Jason. Turns out his mom died earlier this year. I don't know the Maddox family personally, so obviously I didn't really keep in touch with them. I hope she found peace. I asked Jason if he ever had noticed anything on the security cameras and he told me he never even checked them. When I explained that I saw someone standing outside in the video logs, he was speechless for a few minutes. I think he felt guilty. He admitted he always brushed off his mother's scared pleas to leave the house, as her mind finally slipping during the final years of her life. He said he was hesitant to have her move in with his family full time, so he gave her a cell phone in case she ever felt down or needed any help, and also told her he would install the cameras and check them nightly to be sure there was no one outside or in case anyone ever tried to break in. Clearly he was at fault for not believing his mom, but that's not my problem. I asked him if she ever said anything about anyone coming to the house in the middle of the night, to which he replied that she would sometimes see a tall man standing somewhere in the front yard. Since she only started mentioning it the last couple of months before she moved out, he assumed she was just seeing things, and as such, decided to move her into his house instead of investigating. He also mentioned another incident that makes me very nervous the more I think about it. One night in August, about a month before we bought the house, he received a frantic call from his mom that there were people talking in the basement. Jason got there as fast as he could, but when he got there he only found his mother cowering in the living room. He saw no evidence that anyone broke in. I told him not to worry or feel guilty, and I even lied to him and told him that the man only showed up on the surveillance cameras once while his mom lived there, from what I could tell, and that he shouldn't feel badly. I'm not sure if he believed me, but he seemed relieved. It sounds like Mrs. Maddox was clearly of more sound mind than was initially believed during her time living alone in this house. That left me with another disturbing but logical question. Did I have to worry about the voices she heard in the basement? Thankfully, I've never dealt with anything like that. But now I'm worried there might be someone or something else lurking inside the walls of our home, and not just out in our yard. Mary's here, so I'm going to focus on keeping her calm. I'll make some more updates if need be, but tonight will hopefully just be another quiet and uneventful night. Fuck. It's almost 10.30 and the police officers still haven't showed up to sit and watch our house like they did last night. I told Mary another fib to cover up the fact that we were still very much in danger. She's in bed already sleeping. I told her I would be catching up on the work I missed last night. I'm actually holed up in the upstairs office. With a mini fridge full of energy drinks to my right and my trusty shotgun at the ready. I plan to stay glued to my laptop all night watching the live feeds of the outside until the sun rises and I can feel safe again. I've been watching this monitor for an hour now, and I think I'm finally noticing something in the driveway. It's just out of the light, crouched down near the woods, but it's the trespasser. He's completely motionless, but it's definitely him. I think he's been out there for a while now, but... He just twitched slightly a couple times. I'm calling the police as I type this. They've been alerted, and they're now on the way. I know they'll do their best, but I probably won't see them for another 20 minutes. 
I've got the gun on my lap now. I'm going to bring the gun and the laptop with me into the bedroom and lock the door. For Mary's sake. Can't be too safe. In the minute I've taken my attention away from the screen to get fortified in the bedroom, he's completely changed position. That little shadow on the edge of the woods is gone, and now standing at the end of the front yard and almost on the road is the trespasser. His head is craned up towards the sky again. It's almost like he's staring at the camera. Staring at me. It's quiet. Eerie. I know we live in a secluded area, but... He just sprinted towards the house. He's banging on the door. Unsurprisingly, things since my last update have been insanely hectic. I truly haven't been able to find the time to write this next post for you all until right now, so I am sorry for all the worry I caused anyone with the abrupt ending of my previous post. My wife and I, luckily, are once again okay. We're still very shaken up by every little terrifying thing that has happened in the last two days, but thankfully we will be fine. Our bond has only strengthened during all of this. So that is a massive positive and a boatload of negatives. Before I get into the finer details about last night, I want to address something a lot of you have been saying the past two days. It was a bad move for me to withhold the truth from Mary. I thought I was doing the right thing in the moment, but lying to her was a bad idea. I could have gotten her killed, and that makes me feel awful. I came clean with her earlier today and she handled it about as well as I could have expected. My face is still red where she slapped me, but she accepted my apology. I'm not perfect, but I'm glad that my most recent blunder didn't cause any harm. Anyways, here's something I know about what happened last night. When I heard the first bangs on the front door, I could tell almost immediately that the door had no chance of keeping out whoever or whatever was trying to get in. I posted the updates, grabbed the shotgun, and took my terrified wife to the closet. It was the safest option, really. There's only one entrance in the surprisingly spacious closet, and we were able to block the door with our wooden shoe rack. I kept the shotgun in hand until we emerged from our makeshift panic room almost a half hour later. Our house is pretty compact, and the closet we hid in is right above the entryway to the house so we were still able to hear what was happening downstairs pretty clearly. We heard the door splinter, and then slam heavily to the floor in a heap. We then heard the heavy pounds of feet on our wood floor, as whatever was downstairs did who knows what in the entryway. The most disturbing thing we heard was its... voice. Well, it's complicated. It didn't really speak. It just loudly growled and groaned guttural gasps as it... I don't, I don't know, scurried around in our entryway. Mary cuddled close to me, whimpering, and barely managed to get a petrified whisper out to me. Is he saying words? I hadn't been focused on whether it was saying anything before then, so I tried to discern any words that I could understand and, sure enough, I could sort of distinguish what sounded like gibberish between the seemingly pained moans coming from downstairs. It was something like guk bib pivoral va he tezerat. It repeated these same sounds for a few minutes, making rough and sporadic stops in between them, and also occasionally stopping to make pained wheezing sounds. It sounded like a man who had his vocal cords irrevocably damaged was trying to chant something. It was a terrible sound, like a thousand nails on chalkboards. Then after moments of listening to this disturbingly melodic gibberish, our home fell silent again. Mary and I looked at each other. I'm almost positive we were both thinking the same thing at that moment. That we wouldn't leave the closet until we were 100% sure that whatever was downstairs was gone. No matter how quiet it got. And sure enough, after 5 minutes or so, we heard a loud shriek and the now familiar pounding of heavy footsteps on our wooden floor as it sprinted deeper into our house. My heart skipped about 10 beats as we heard it pounding on a door inside the house. 
We would have heard him coming up the steps if it was the door to our bedroom. So we both breathed a sigh of relief as we heard him forcing his way into our basement. Everything else happened almost too quickly to process. We heard the door to our basement break with a similar crackle as the front door, followed by a few thuds in immediate succession, followed by the bangs of footsteps it made as it charged down into our basement. We heard another relatively distant but still blood-curdling shriek come from the creature, and then silence again. It wasn't much longer before we heard a shout coming from downstairs. The police arrived on the scene in full force probably 20 minutes after receiving my call. I had told the operator I was fortifying myself in my bedroom and where my bedroom was, so I wasn't too surprised to hear knocking on the door minutes after they had entered the house. I was a little nervous to leave the safety of the closet, as my imagination had me worried about whatever had broken into my house and disguising itself as a police officer to lower my guard. But when the voice on the other side of the door addressed me by name, I realized that it was Sergeant James speaking with me. If you don't remember, he was one of the officers who came to my house when I first phoned the police about the trespasser. He escorted Mary and I out of the house while the rest of the police officers marched down into the basement. There were even more officers with their guns at the ready outside. I finally felt safe for the first time all night. Sergeant James took us to an ambulance parked at the end of our driveway where paramedics awaited us to make sure we were okay. After we were cleared medically, we hopped in Sergeant James' patrol car, and he took us to the station for questioning. I should backtrack a little bit. Even though Sergeant James clearly wanted to get us out of the house as quickly as possible, I was to observe the chaos that lay on the floor just inside my front doorway. There were the expected but disturbing sights such as the wrecked front door lying on the floor, and the large scratch marks on the door frame. But there was one unexpected piece of evidence that disturbs me on a whole different level. The police have said nothing about it still, no matter how much I've asked. Starting on the front porch, splashed upon the splintered piece of door that lay upon the floor, and streaking all across the floor in a jagged line leading to the basement, was a dark crimson substance. Obviously, my first guess would be blood, but since this whole situation is extremely bizarre, I can't really be sure. If anyone has any ideas on what it is, or why the creature would just be bleeding all over the place, please let me know. I don't know if the police are withholding information from me or simply do not know the truth themselves, but I can't stop thinking about it. Once we got to the police station, Mary and I were given time to relax as best as we could. We hugged each other and cried, and that's pretty much all we've been able to do since leaving our house. It's hard to relax during times like these. They began questioning us a little before 7am. Most of the questioning was uneventful, or pertained to things I already mentioned in one of these three posts, so I won't bore you all with too many details. However, one of the detectives stated that whatever I had discovered in my yard two nights ago was most likely not human. He based this on an examination of the marks on my front door frame, basement door, and some of my walls. The examination revealed that they were simply too deep and too wide to be caused by normal human fingernails. They were caused by something more durable than fingernails. Maybe a large knife, or maybe large claws and the forensics suggest that the marks are so uniform in length and distance between each other that they're too precise to be caused by separate blows. Unsurprisingly, they told us we won't be able to stay in our house for a significant amount of time, which I am perfectly fine with. Mary was able to get us a room in a cheap hotel for now, and we will most likely make the trip to Mary's sisters to stay with her until we figure out what to do. I'm writing this now from our hotel room, my laptop was kept as evidence, and I gave the police permission to check the surveillance cameras on it. So I'm using my phone to write this. I don't know what happened in my small, quiet neighborhood after I left my house early this morning. The police are being secretive about everything, but I don't really care at this point. I'm just glad that this whole situation finally seems to be under control.
I'm going to catch up on the two days worth of sleep that I mostly lost out on. Have a nice night, everyone. The ringing on my phone woke me up half an hour ago. I answered. On the other end was Detective Laird. One of the detectives involved with combing the crime scene. I didn't know what to expect, since I'd already told the police everything I knew. He asked me how many exits there were to my house, to which I replied three. There's the front door, the back door, and the storm door leading out of the basement. I said obviously the windows would be used as an exit as well, but he confirmed that none had been open or broken upon investigating the house. There was a long pause, and then I heard Detective Laird swallow air nervously. Then he explained. Well, your house is currently surrounded by police officers, and it has been since the moment we got here. Not a single officer outside has seen the intruder leave your home. Inside the house. Even more officers have checked every inch of the house and haven't found any sign that the intruder is still here. I said nothing. We've checked the security feeds on your laptop as well. We watched and rewatched and rewatched again every second of the recordings. No sign of the intruder leaving. We don't know where he went. I don't know what to do anymore. Two nights ago, after speaking with Detective Laird about the creature that broke into my home, I'm pretty sure I had a panic attack. I couldn't catch my breath no matter how hard I tried. It felt like my throat had closed up. I shouldn't have fallen back asleep after hearing that terrifying news, but I did. I had no choice. Maybe it was all the stress of the last few days. Maybe it was the panic attack. Or maybe it was something else entirely, but I did fall asleep. And that night I had the most vivid dream I've ever had. Usually my dreams are a jumbled mess of nonsense, but this one seemed to flow much more coherently than normal. It seemed to tell me something. I found myself in my home's entryway yet again. It was still very much in shambles like it had been when Sergeant James escorted Mary and I to safety for questioning. The door still lay on the floor, and the trail of the crimson blood-like substance still flowed like a makeshift road leading to the basement. In the dream, this red path led down to the stairs, and into the unfinished part of the basement, which is immediately on your right once you reach the bottom of the stairs. I didn't go into that part of the basement though, most likely because I have always been terrified of that room. When we first saw the home, the room was still being used as storage by Mrs. Maddox, and her late husband's excess belongings. I never really thought about why it actually made me so uneasy. My fear of that room was as strong as it was irrational as long as I've lived there. In the main room of the basement I saw Mary. She was facing away from me. I heard her whimpering and saw her shaking like she was the night we took shelter in our bedroom closet. I called to her and she immediately stopped trembling. Her head snapped towards me, but she never looked fully at me. Something about her was different. I wish I could explain it better because it was so alarming, but I can't really put it into words at the moment. With her head still turned but not fully looking in my direction, she started whispering something. We never leave, we never leave, over and over and over again. I turned my head to my left, towards the abominable room, to see that the door wasn't there. It had unsurprisingly been broken down. The crimson trail led into that room, but I couldn't see more than a few steps past the doorway. It seemed like all the light had been drained from the room. Usually there was enough natural light from the small windows to make out the outline of the room and its contents. Regardless of the seemingly amplified darkness, I was able to see the outline of a person standing there. The only thing I could tell for certain was that it wasn't the creature, because this figure was about my height. The figure stood in the doorway, bathed in darkness, and stretched their arm outwards towards me before being pulled back into the darkness. Before I could do anything in response, Mary crawled into the dark room on all fours. 
I tried to chase after her, but I was frozen. I jolted awake at 8.13 a.m. It took me a few moments to realize that I had just been dreaming, and that I was still in the hotel room in bed next to my still sleeping wife. Like I said, I have never had a dream quite as vivid as that one. The details of my home were perfectly accurate. I knew from that moment that the dream meant something, but I'm still not really sure what exactly. At this point, I wasn't sure if I would be returning to my home to investigate farther, but the dream seemed like it was trying to tell me that if I did go to my home, there was probably something of note in the basement. Mary and I got lunch, and discussed what our next move should be. She was set on moving away from this place and never looking back, something that I was reluctantly leaning towards as well. We both knew that this move would alter our lives forever, and would also mean we'd have to scramble for a new way to provide for ourselves, but we didn't really care at this point. We agreed that we would make a return trip to our home to get my car out of the driveway, and that would be the last time we ever set foot on the property again. We determined that we would get there once we were done eating lunch, and meet up at her sister's house afterwards. At our house, there was the expected hustle and bustle for a crime scene, especially for one as interesting as my home. I spoke with Detective Laird in the front yard. He told me that the house had been scoured at least six more times since we last spoke, and that there was still no creature sighting to report. The police, for all the good they've done and for all the patience they've shown, really do seem to be hiding something from us. It's not that they seem malicious, but it seems more like they're on damage control and want to just deny everything. When I asked Detective Laird if I would be getting my laptop back anytime soon, he spewed out some rant about how the laptop seems to have a virus, and how they had to take it back to the station to run diagnostics, and figure out what went wrong with it. It all seemed canned. Like someone above him on the law enforcement food chain told him what to tell me, and hope I wouldn't question it. I didn't want trouble, so I told him he would never have to worry about me interfering again. As I walked to my car I remembered the game cameras I'd placed in the woods. I wasn't sure if the police ever found them, but my curiosity couldn't be contained. I decided that I had a great chance to get these cameras later in the night. Worst case scenario, the police find me and I make up some bullshit excuse about just wanting to get my friend his cameras I borrowed. Best case scenario, I find something new that helps me understand this whole situation a little better. Regardless, I knew I had to do it to ease my troubled mind. I phoned Mary and told her that I was staying behind to help the police. I know, I'm an asshole for lying to her again, but honestly, if I told her what I was actually doing, she'd either try to keep me from looking for the truth because she was scared, or she'd want to come with me and would put herself in great danger. I think this time it's entirely warranted. I nervously drove around until nightfall. Finally, I made my way back to the house at about 9.30. It was dark and I was determined to find the truth. I really didn't want to be back at this place but I knew that if I didn't at least look for any signs that might explain all this, that I'd likely go insane. Finding these game cameras seemed like the safest way I could find the truth. The first thing to cross my mind when I arrived at my house after dark was a simple observation. It's a lot quieter now. And not just in the sense that it was nighttime. There were no police officers there. Less than six hours ago, my home had been lively. There were at least eight officers still on perimeter duty, plus many other police officers inside on Monster Watch. There were forensic crews trying to find any sort of solid evidence they could use to understand what had happened within the walls of my home. The house had fallen eerily silent once again, and once again I hated it. But I saw an opportunity. I dashed to the front porch, and inside the front of my door I found waiting for me the exact same sight from my dream. My entryway was still a chaotic scene of destruction, with the crimson path summoning me to investigate the basement. I recalled my dream and the feelings I felt down below the surface. I wanted to turn around, but instead I found myself at the top of the stairs. 
Looking down the stairs, I saw the destroyed door, lying right where it had in my dream. I saw the crimson trail turn right and go into the terrifying unfinished room in the basement. I thought about taking a step downwards, but the silence of the house was shattered before I could. It started as a faint, but constant and indecipherable whisper. Voices emanating from the basement. As the voices grew in volume, they became more distinct but became no easier to decipher. There were at least four voices involved, but there could have easily been more voices speaking. They all spoke at once, sometimes over each other. I don't know to whom they belonged, but I do know that these voices must have been the ones Mrs. Maddox heard that caused her son to move her out. This is my attempt at transcribing some of what I heard emanating from the basement. There was an older man. Does anything remain in this? Then there was a younger man. Here, there. Then there was the older man again. So misplaced. Then there was a woman. I want to... And I couldn't hear the rest. Then there was another woman. For reasons unknown. And then it was the younger man again. I lived in the dark. I truly cannot be sure that any of this text is correct, but that transcript is the best I can do. There was loud and indecipherable whispering that was an omnipresent undertone to what could barely be called a conversation. I also heard a woman crying at different times during the exchange. The whispering never stopped despite the other voices speaking. While the crying was sporadic, but occurred when both women's voices were speaking. I stepped onto the top step of the basement, and the damn step creaked louder than a step ever has in the history of stairs. The voices immediately stopped. So did the whispering and crying. They all screeched to a halt. The unnatural silence returned. My heart did a drum roll. I ran to my car, with my legs churning unrestricted of my brain. I didn't care anymore. Fuck the truth and fuck those game cameras. I wanted to live my life. I wanted to grow old with Mary. I didn't want to end up in the basement with whatever was down there. As I started the car, I noticed the creature was now standing in the doorway of my home. He was facing away from me, looking inside of my house. As if it knew I was looking at it, it turned its head 180 degrees to look at me. It wore the same confused look on its face that it had when I accidentally discovered it a few nights prior. It mouthed something at me, and then sprinted deeper into my house with its eyes still locked upon me. I write this final update from the comfort of my parents' beach house. Over 400 miles away from my haunted little home in the middle of nowhere, Mary and I look forward to starting our new life together far away from that place. Tomorrow begins our job search. However, I am unable to stop looking over my shoulder every time I hear the settling of this house or the crackling of the air conditioning coming alive to cool our home. There still exist dark corners of our world, untouched by the light we consider ourselves so safe inside of. If you look hard enough for them, you will find them. If you listen closely for them, you will hear them beckon you. Once you've discovered them, you will only see their darkness. We spend our lives trying to outrun them, but the truth is we never escape them. Last night, I woke up in that basement. Mary was there. She acknowledged my presence, but never looked at me. I could hear crying, but I didn't know where it came from. We never leave. We never leave. The stalking started out lightly enough. I noticed a customer in the shoe store I work in that did more wandering around the store than actually looking at the product. After a while, I finally confronted the guy. I almost immediately recognized him as a weird, kind of nerdy kid I'd had a few classes with in high school. 
but didn't say anything as I didn't have any real exchanges with him. I searched my brain for his name and remembered that it was Kyle. His face brightened up at my approach and I assumed he was glad to have an employee offer help. I asked him if there was anything I could help him with. He continued to smile and almost seem long tied. The exchange didn't become uncomfortable, however, until he answered my questions with, you're just always so beautiful, and reached to touch my hair. I flinched back, which didn't seem to deter him much as he continued to try to touch it. Gratefully, a co-worker saw my clear discomfort and intervened. I was able to slip away to the safety of the back room, but it didn't deter him from staying in the store long enough to cause security to escort him out. From there, it was every single day. He was at my work, wandering around, asking other employees if I was on schedule that day and if he could speak to me. He'd often refer to me as his girlfriend. He wrote notes, too, to be given to me. In them, he told me that his obsession ran back to high school, but didn't manifest until he'd come into my work at random and saw me for the first time in a few years. It changed everything about his life, and he said that he always imagined us together. It only got worse when he was banned from the mall the store resided in altogether. I hoped so deeply that this was enough to make him go away. However, when I returned to my car at close, I found roses and a photo of me getting into my car the night before with See You At Home written in red sharpie. I began to panic, frantically glancing around the parking lot, before realizing that the note likely meant that Kyle probably knew where I lived, and could even be there already. I finally called the police, too afraid to even go in the direction of home before being entirely sure it was safe. Sure enough, the dispatch officers found my lock picked. A trail of rose petals led from the door into my bedroom. He had gone through my clothes, picked out a dress and a set of lingerie, and laid them out on the bed. Additionally, there was a fabric baggie with a few small bones, some twigs, and a red feather tucked under my pillow. There was no note this time, but the message was clear enough for me. Despite the obviousness of the situation, the police would not pull charges against Kyle. The absence of a handwritten note couldn't 100% connect his stalking to the break-in. Helplessness washed over me and I realized pretty quickly that I couldn't live alone anymore. I had an extra room and one of my co-workers, Adrian, had recently been abandoned by a roommate. This was supposed to make me feel safe and maybe even scare off my stalker. But again, it didn't deter him at all. He knew that breaking in was risky, but he'd still leave things in the mailbox, my car, things buried in the yard, just anywhere he knew I'd find it, really. There were a lot more of those little fabric baggies with weird items inside. A friend once joked that it was witchcraft, but I didn't find that at all funny. During this time, he drove past my house 20 to 30 times a day. This is not illegal, so the police did nothing, even when he clearly parked across the street and watched me from his car. Obviously, Kyle misunderstood my roommate's situation, became jealous, and began threatening Adrian. These were much darker and more violent. There was a point where Adrian's mother called him in tears. Someone had killed their outdoor cat and left it in an unspeakable position on the hood of her van. I was later sent photos of what barely resembled a cat. Baking in the hot sun on the hood of a car, black paint circled the gore and there were four weird, barely legible symbols painted in what I can only assume was cat blood. Again, the police could not prove that it was Kyle, so they did nothing aside from advising that the car not be drove until a mechanic could confirm that it had not been tampered with. Adrian quit his job and moved in with his mother. I couldn't stand being alone, so I had no choice but to break my lease and move back home with my own parents. I haven't spoken to Adrian since and he began actively avoiding me. I didn't blame him. I was fucking terrified for myself and everyone around me. Kyle already knew where my parents lived, 
the day after move-in. I woke up to more roses on my car hood and two large gift boxes stuffed in my back seat. I sighed. Checked the car for weird bags. Found one tucked under the hood and tossed it in the trash. Soon this became the routine. Throwing shit in the trash. Constantly checking over my shoulder. Anyone close to me became too threatened to stick around. My constant rejection only made Kyle's weird gifts more violent. Roses, chocolates, and presents became dead strays. Animal blood smeared onto my car or the house. And threatening notes. In these notes, he continued to state that he was giving me chances to come on my own. But was losing his patience. And promised me that he had a foolproof way to make me his. But I wouldn't like it. It'll be painful. Trust me, he'll make it hurt. He often referred to another man in these letters, but only when giving these ultimatums. There were a few closer encounters. He'd wait until I was in a crowded public place. At least alone enough that he could get in close proximity without being recognized. Once I noticed him, he knew his time was limited, and would speedily begin proclaiming his love for me, and begging me to be with him. Between insults and cursing, mind you. Before running off to avoid being caught. By this time, the police had done absolutely nothing for me. But once hearing my story, most public places and shops were more than willing to give me any security camera footage that contained the exchanges in hopes that I could use it for future charges. By this time, Kyle had been stalking me for nearly a year. I spent every single day in fear but I was starting to feel like I had everything I needed to finally get him. All it would really take was a definite step over the line of the law of justice. Just once. However, just when it seemed like karma might finally bite him, everything stopped. No weird little baggies. No gifts or threatening letters. I didn't immediately feel hopeful. I didn't normally see him every single day before. He always at least took one day off. But after two weeks of absolutely nothing, I was ready to believe he might have given up. This was not the case. And I was only informed of this fact by being knocked out from behind while trying to get into my car after work. I don't remember falling forward and striking my face on the top of the car door. I don't remember collapsing. I do remember, in a split moment, thinking to myself, I knew he didn't go anywhere. I came to consciousness for a few moments in the trunk of my own car, but couldn't keep awake. I didn't snap out of it until hours later. My vision was blurry and dark, and I tried to move my arms and legs, only to find them bound with something plastic and far too tight. Zip ties. They were pressing much too hard into my wrists and I stopped moving entirely to minimize the pain. Blinking a little more, my vision finally started to come back, and I began taking in my surroundings. I was laying on my side on a metal framed bed, with white and pink floral sheets. The room was otherwise bare of furniture besides an old, shadeless lamp placed in the center of the floor. The windows were covered with black trash bags. I listened for movement outside of the room, but heard none. For what felt like hours, I laid there in silence, afraid to move and knowing that there was absolutely no way I could escape with my ankles bound. Kyle finally entered the room, carrying a very full-looking backpack. Oh good, you're awake. It's required that you're awake for this. My mouth wasn't covered, but I didn't dare say anything. He saw the fear on my face, but was unsympathetic. Don't look at me like that. You should have listened. You brought this upon yourself. Kyle sat the backpack down on the floor and began unloading the items inside. He pulled out an empty mason jar. A large ziplock of black powder of some sort. Another ziplock with some kind of animal gore inside. Four varying sized blades. And a tiny green book. I thought back to every creepy little fabric baggie, to every threatening and ritualistic usage of dead animals and blood, and suddenly wondered why I had barely thought of it. 
even deemed it as nothing more than fear tactic. He started pouring the black powder into a large circle, the lamp in the center, which he then proceeded to empty the gore next to. It smelled horribly of rot and copper. I had to fight my gag reflex. He then grabbed the smallest of the four knives and fear began to well up worse than ever before. I couldn't keep quiet anymore and started pleading for him to let me go. I cried and told him I'd never tell anyone. He just chuckled. <laughs> Give it up. If you really meant that, you would have let me love you in the first place. You wouldn't have made it come to this. He said this while pointing the knife at me and I shut my mouth. Kyle then grabbed the jar, opened it, and sat down with it and the knife in the center of the room. He cut into the palm of his hand and began allowing the blood to flow into the jar. He didn't need much before he was satisfied, and began using the blood to create another very thin, concentric circle inside the black powder, right around the lamp and gore. He dumped the rest onto the crude pile of animal gore. Then Kyle reached his hand into the jar, wiped up the caked blood inside with his hand, and proceeded to smear it all over his face. With his other hand covered in blood, he approached me and covered my face as well. It had cooled and started to become sticky, and the overwhelming smell of it started to make me nauseous again. He turned away wordlessly and snatched the green book from the floor. He opened directly to a page he had bookmarked with a similar red feather to those I'd often find in his weird bags. Before reading, he turned to me and smiled. You're going to love this. He looked back to the pages and began reading off the contents. It registered like complete gibberish at first, before I realized that he was reading, or actually butchering reading off another language. I don't know if it was Latin or Italian or fucking Klingon. He stuttered over some words, mispronounced others several times before either feeling content that he'd pronounced it correctly, or otherwise assuming it was close enough, and moving on to the next word. If I hadn't been so frightened for my life, I would have found this grating and annoying. Despite the lack of grace, whatever he was saying was doing something for sure. I felt the bed start to shake under me. The bulb of the center of the lamp began flickering. From nowhere a circling wind picked up within the room and I could smell something much more rotten above the blood on my face or the soaked animal remains in the center of the room. I could no longer hold my stomach and threw up bile onto the mattress under my head. Kyle didn't notice as he continued to stumble over words. Speaking faster now and no longer stopping to correct his jumbled reading and mispronunciations. It suddenly seemed like the room itself was occupied by a darkness. I felt like a billion eyes were on me. Kyle and the whole room. He paused his chanting and began to laugh wildly. Yes, here it comes. He's really coming. He's finally going to make you love me. He cheered for a moment before turning his attention back to the book and resuming. The darkness started to make a centralized form, which was genuinely just a towering pillar of concentrated… blackness. Somewhere from within, red light burned inside, which was the only thing that separated its shape from the rest of the enclosing darkness. Soon the light of the lamp reflected off of nothing except the bed, myself, and Kyle who looked at the being with excitement and wonder. He spoke, but it sounded much quieter than before, the sound being almost eaten by the darkness around us. I can't believe you're here. I can't believe you came to me. No sound came from the pillar at first. It instead moved forward towards the pile of gore. The darkness of its body moved over top of the remains and the red light glowed brighter from within for a moment. It moved backwards to its previous position, and the red light inside of it darkened a little after a moment. The gore had disappeared, and every drop of blood was now cleaned from where it sat. Kyle saw the overwhelming silence as a chance to speak again. I beg that you consider my wish. I seek love, but she won't be with me. 
He gestured to me. I don't need her soul as long as she can't fight my love. Please make it happen. A high tone screamed from the pillar and pierced through my ears into my brain. Words, almost like my own organic thoughts, entered my brain. The voice was stern, deep, and emotionless. Bumbling fool, we are no slave of yours. Disrespect is not tolerated. Kyle clearly received the words directed at him and fell to his knees. No, it's not fair. I brought you here. I control you. You will listen to me. The responding tone was higher this time, but the voice penetrating my mind was still calm and unaffected. You have shamed us enough. Before Kyle could react, the pillar began to glow red through the blackness of its shape more now than ever before as it swiftly floated forward and over his entire being. The room fell completely still, and no more noise came from its shape. Moments passed as it didn't move, but I started to notice that the darkness surrounding the room itself began to dissipate a bit. It was then that the darkness of the pillar's form turned red and mist-like. The air within the room itself became filled with the moisture before the figure started to dissolve, leaving no trace of Kyle. The room was empty and quiet, as normal as it had been before, although a moisture still hung thick in the air. At this point, I couldn't have moved if I wanted to. Shock had overcome me and I was far too busy running through a billion questions inside of my head to even consider my originally underestimated predicament. However, not too long afterwards, I heard voices coming from somewhere outside of the house I was being kept in. I started screaming as loudly as I possibly could until I heard the crash of the door being broken down. Obviously, due to a year's almost non-stop stalking, the police and my family had a pretty good idea of who to look into as soon as I didn't return home from work. Kyle's mother gave him away pretty quickly, telling the police that she'd kicked him out a few years before and he'd moved into a small house his grandparents had left him. She also said that he'd been doing devil worshipper shit in their basement, being the main reason she decided to kick him out. She didn't initially say anything about these interests, the few times police did take my stalking case seriously enough to question her. Look, I was already known as the stalker kid's mom. I didn't need the extra label of crazy satanists added on. She said. This is a strongly Christian household. I couldn't even speak after being untied and removed from the room. I didn't start speaking until I was hooked up to sedatives at the hospital. Still, I was both horribly afraid of looking crazy myself, and also afraid of what might come after me if I told the truth. Instead, I decided to test the real story out on my mother in private, who believed me but begged me not to tell the police or doctors. She said it was beyond anything they can understand or help. So we ultimately fabricated a story that I woke up in the house alone just before the police arrived. Since then, Kyle has been marked as wanted and on the run. It's been quite some time since, and my life has actually gotten better. In fact, it's been extremely lucky. More so than ever in my life. I finally was able to obtain a job in my ridiculously elusive field, and left the mall shoe store behind me. I also met the love of my life, which was coincidentally my biggest crush from junior high who moved away when we were kids but came back a few months after my abduction, when her job surprised her with a promotion that moved her there. Despite this, I still have nightmares. Not of Kyle, I know for a fact he's never coming back. I just can't get the pillar out of my mind. I don't think it would ever come back for me. In fact, I felt like a bug on the cosmic scale in comparison to that thing but I can't shake the feeling that I saw something people aren't supposed to see. And I fear the more I talk about it, the more I risk my own life and soul.
When I was a child, I used to Santeria being a part of my family's culture. I was used to seeing my grandmother, my mom, my aunts and great aunts pray, but in a ritualistic fashion. They prayed as if their prayers were a spell, something darker than one might see at a usual Catholic mass. Most of their prayers involved a woman named Janie. I was never quite certain who she was, as she wasn't a relative or an associate of the family business. But she always seemed to be around, and she always seemed to have a very pleasant, almost mystical sense about her. I came to find myself very comfortable with Janie, as if she was just another part of the family. When I'd ask who she was to me, my family would just say that she was a family friend, but our relation was never actually established. Still, it was strange to me that one very average summer night, my parents woke me to packed bags and excitedly claimed that we were going on a trip with Janie and that a few members of our extended family would be joining. My family traveled across Texas frequently. Trips to Houston or San Antonio were not uncommon. And my family always preferred driving at night. I enjoyed this because I found a sense of serenity, looking out the window and seeing nothing but darkness as we drove by. Sometimes the light from the headlights would illuminate surrounding trees, and I'd watch out for deer or other animals caught off guard. There was a sense of mystery and terrifying thrill in the darkness of the Texas countryside. It was late that night, and I was still very tired. I played my usual game staring out the car window as mysterious trees passed us by, wondering what mysteries lurked behind the brush. Yet I never thought to question where we were going, or even why. It had been a rather boring summer, and I was silently relieved to finally have a vacation story to tell when school began again in the fall. We drove for just over an hour before I recognized the causeway that separates Port Isabel from South Padre Island. I love the beach, and we hadn't been in ages. The fact that we traveled at night most certainly meant that we would be visiting the local water park in the morning, and in my half-asleep haze, I smiled and felt a natural sense of excitement. I was an only child, so these moments of thrill and joy were far and few a many. We reached the island and I dozed off again, assuming my parents would wake me up when we'd arrived at our resort or hotel. I was awoken just a half hour later, only we weren't outside of a hotel at all. We were at a beach access, on the outskirts of the usually populated shore. This was bizarre to me, as I didn't think it was practical to visit a beach at night. I had no idea what high tide was, or how it worked, but I knew it happened at night, and I knew that it was something adults tried to avoid. Still, there we were, on a deserted beach access, myself, eleven of my blood relatives, and Janie. The next thing I remember is my mother pulling me aside from the huddled family. She seemed so excited for us to be there, and even more excited for me, as to why I had no idea. Almost as if I'd won some sort of award. There was a sense of pride in her voice as she led me away telling me that it was time to get in the water. I remember the water being extremely cold, colder than I had ever imagined. What was stranger still is that my mother led me into the ocean while we were still wearing the outfits we had arrived in. In fact, I hadn't seen a single person with a swimsuit, towel, or usual beach gear. I grew anxious about the fact that I was standing in the gulf in jeans and a t-shirt, but to a child like myself, there was still a sense of excitement and adventure in the event, so I didn't question it. I remember the moonlight shining bright and full, the only thing illuminating the shore, and the blurry faces of my relatives as they huddled on the narrow shoreline. My mother led me deeper into the sea and started to pull my shirt off. Up to that point, that was the only practical thing that seemed to have been taking place. She helped me out of my soaking jeans, leaving me in my briefs, which she proceeded to take off as well. 
At that point, I was standing naked in the ocean, freezing, and lit only by a seemingly brightening moonlight. My mother was still in her day clothes then, and she had a small bag wrapped around her shoulder from which she pulled a jar without a label or wrapping. She opened it and scraped a gunk of some kind out of it, and began spreading it all over my body. This is when a sense of extreme curiosity and confusion began to set in. I asked my mother what she was doing and what that substance was, but she remained silent. It didn't look or smell like sunscreen, and at that time I was naive enough to think that sunscreen wouldn't be necessary anyway, as it was nighttime. It wasn't until she rubbed the gunk on my face, and I managed to taste it that I realized she had coated the vast majority of my body in honey. Once she was done, she began to remove her own clothes. Her shirt, her jeans, then her bra and panties. I was in a state of shock and natural disgust, as no little boy wants to see their mother naked. She then began coating her own body in honey. Yet the shock of her nudity was overpowered still by the sheer confusion of me standing in the ocean, also covered in honey. I was so distracted by my mother's naked body, and the bizarreness of us being covered in honey that I hadn't realized that the other members of our family and Janie had formed a circle around us in the sea, all of them removing their clothes, all of them also coating their naked bodies. I was ordered to remain in the center, and my mother took a place in the circle surrounding me with the others. I looked around in shock at my naked relatives, and in a shaking voice, asked what was going on. It was then that I felt a hand on my shoulder. A soft, familiar hand. It was Janie's. She reached for my hand, and softly placed something round and cold in my palm. It was an egg. She crouched down to my level and told me to submerge the egg underwater. I hesitantly and frightfully obliged. As I did, she pressured my head under the water's surface, much like one might baptize a child. And when I resurfaced, she demanded that I hold the egg down on the sandy ocean floor and crush it with my hand. I did. As I pulled the cracked shells and thick yolk residue out from beneath the surface, I noticed that my hand was covered in a thick, black substance. The familiar metallic scent made it obvious that it was blood. Thinking that the eggshells had somehow penetrated my skin, I put my hand under the water and tried to wash it off. To my surprise, I felt no sting from the salt water. My hand was fine. No cuts, no gashes or scratches. The blood was gone. Janie returned to the circle, and I saw the moonlight silhouette of my mother approaching me as my relatives made their way back to dry land. She hugged me, carried me up, and kissed my cheek. My terror was subtly subdued, but my confusion remained. I asked my mom what we were doing there again, but again I received no response. I was carried to the car where a change of clothes was awaiting me. I didn't ask any more questions. It must have been three or four in the morning by then. We drove to a nearby restaurant and then made the hour long trip back to our house in McAllen. When I awoke the next afternoon, it felt like the whole thing had been a dream. Yet I knew we'd eaten at a restaurant the night before. It was all far too real, in spite of its surreality. I asked my family if we would be returning to the beach and they said no that we were vacationing in San Antonio that summer. I asked about the night before and they immediately denied it. What I found strange then, and stranger still in hindsight, is that they found no humor in my story considering they're denying the entire thing. It was a subject they avoided, and a question they silenced quickly and aggressively. I stopped asking questions after a couple of years, and although I knew it wasn't a dream, left in the back burner of my mind until it became a strange memory that only arose when triggered. We never saw Janie again after that, and the memory became less and less present in my daily train of thought, soon overshadowed by the traumas of adolescence and young adulthood. It wasn't until right now, sitting in the living room of some friend's apartment, 
sharing strange stories that it surfaced again. I told my story thinking that people would find it just as far-fetched and probably as made up as I found most of theirs, until one of my friends began to cry and left the room. She had experienced the exact same thing when she was 10 years old, old enough to remember it clearly. Old enough to know she was never supposed to talk about the event. She was hesitant to mention details, but after I implored she admitted remembering having stood on the outer circle, removing her clothes and coating herself in honey surrounded by her parents and nine strangers, as a small boy whom she didn't know was led to the center of the circle and forced to break an egg under the water's surface. We've done little research, but have yet to find any explanation for the event we had both experienced at different points in our lives. This is still a mystery, and it'll likely remain one, unless anyone else has experienced it too. We aren't sure we'll ever find out why we were involved in these rituals, but for now, they remain strange childhood memories. The stairwell at my office building was notorious for being creepy. The lights inside hadn't been changed for years, meaning they flickered on and off constantly. The janitorial staff was either too lazy or didn't have enough time to clean it, because it was always covered with dirt and grime. We tried to avoid it as much as possible. I was lucky. I'd gotten a job there right out of college, along with two others, Kelsey and Mick who were both my pretty good friends. It was Mick who suggested we try the game with the stairs. When I heard the rules, I was convinced that he had completely ripped off the elevator game. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that lately. There's been a ton of stories about that all over the internet. He admitted it was quite similar, but insisted he hadn't come up with it himself. We never were able to figure out where he had gotten the instructions. The rules were pretty simple. Find a building with a stairwell. The number of stories had to be odd. The taller you can get, the better. But it can be done with as little as 7 or 5. Ours had 15, so it was perfect. Step 2. Place one player at the bottom of the stairwell, one at the top, and one as close to the middle floor as you can get. Then the player on the bottom will walk up, and the player on the top will walk down. The pace is important. Both must do this at a relaxed speed. Slowing down or speeding up will skew the results. The player in the middle must wait there until either the ascender or descender reaches them. Whichever one gets there first, the middle player must travel in the opposite direction. The first to reach the middle must wait until the loser, or the one that didn't get to the middle first, reaches them then go in the opposite direction of the original middle. For example, if the descender reaches the middle player first, the middle player ascends while the first descender waits for the loser to come up, at which point they will swap places. The loser waiting in the middle while the first descender continues descending. Once the spaces have been jumbled about, one on the top, one in the middle, and one on the bottom, the ritual is repeated two more times. Then, as Mick described it, something will happen. It sounded needlessly complicated, and the unclear nature of what the something was made it hard for Mick to convince us to do it. In all honesty, it seemed like a thinly veiled attempt to get us to exercise. But we were bored one Friday night, and all three of us had keys to the building, so we decided to give it a go. We drew straws to determine our roles. I was placed on the top, Mick got the middle, and Kelsey stood on the bottom. For maximum effect, we waited until 11.30 at night to sneak into the building. The janitorial staff had left an hour previously. It was highly unlikely that our game would be interrupted. We met on the 8th floor, phones fully charged. The rules didn't stipulate it, but we decided we'd text each other when we got to our respective positions. It would make communication a lot easier. Kelsey protested that I was at the top and would easily beat her to the middle. 
as walking down is way less tiring than walking up. Mick pointed out that in order to get my spot, I would have to climb up while she would have to climb down. He assumed the extra work would tire me out a little and slow my pace. With a nod, we left. I heard Kelsey's footfalls echoing up towards me. May the best man win. Mick called out as I lost sight of him. True to their reputation, the lights flickered on practically every flight I passed them. Between the 11th and 12th floors, the bulbs went out completely and I had to climb in the shadows for a few moments. It sent a chill down my spine and I quickened my pace. My legs, admittedly, felt a little weary by the time I reached the top. Checking my phone, I saw that Kelsey had beaten me to her position by about 10 seconds. It wasn't looking good. Peering down the center, I saw that the light was still out between 11 and 12, creating a dark space contrasting with the 14 other bright spaces I could see. I replied that I was in position. Before I could get my bearings, Mick texted go, and I started my trek down. It was much easier descending than ascending. I found myself picking up my pace when my foot suddenly slipped and I stumbled, running into the wall on the 10th floor. I swayed for a few seconds before regaining my senses and continuing down, but I was too late. Kelsey sneered at me as I reached the 8th floor landing. I could hear Mick making his way down. She patted me on the shoulder as she went up. Ah, better luck next time. I leaned against the wall as I waited for the confirmation text to come in. To my surprise, Mix came in a full 15 seconds before Kelsey. From her, instead of a confirmation, I got a picture of a dent in the wall and a foot-shaped smear in the dirt on the 10th floor landing. Did somebody trip? She asked. I texted back, Yeah, now go. Instantly the stairwell echoed with the footfalls. I stood there, appreciating the small rest before my lungs would start burning again from all the climbing. Much to my dismay, about a minute later, Mick reached me first. I questioned how he, the guy who ate Doritos and Gatorade for lunch every day, managed to beat Kelsey by ascending but held my tongue. He gave me a smug grin as I started. It's a long way down. I want to pack a tent. He laughed as he disappeared from my sight. Two floors later, I heard Kelsey arrive and swap places with Mick, who started up. Almost to the bottom, I began to curse Mick for this stupid experiment. What was this supposed to accomplish? Would we find gold once it was done? Would we be cursed and have some ghost come kill us? The anger subsided when I reached the first floor. I did need to go to the gym more often. If anything, I was getting a workout. I sent my confirmation only seconds before Mick sent his. With a go from Kelsey, I charged up the stairs. I didn't care if I was breaking the rules of the game. The quicker I got the last round out of the way, the quicker I could get out of there. I thought I was doing well before I reached the seventh floor and heard Mick call down. You lose. Sure enough, Kelsey's ascending footsteps followed shortly after. I cursed in frustration as I reached the eighth floor. Mick smiled smugly at me as we swapped places, him heading down. Wait, what happens now? I asked. He turned and shrugged. I don't know. At least I got you off your ass tonight, right? He laughed and started down. Kelsey's what now from the chat came a few seconds later. My reply was interrupted by a series of texts from Mick, who was reporting his floors in real time as he went down. Six, five, four, three, two. I looked down the center. Just as Mick's foot hit the bottom of the stairwell, the lights on the first floor shut off. There was silence for a few seconds, followed by a blood-curdling scream echoing from down below. Three seconds passed, which I spent wondering what happened to Mick. Had he slipped and hit his head? 
Did he twist his ankle? Was he just fucking with us? I didn't have any time to think about it farther. Immediately the lights on the second floor shut off. Three more seconds. Then the third. Then the fourth. By the time the fifth shut off, I had made the connection. Running for the stairs, I made it to the landing between eight and nine by the time the sixth had shut off. Somewhere above me I heard Kelsey scream, asking what happened. The seventh shut off below as I reached the ninth. I cried out for her to get out. Reaching the tenth as the eighth went dark. The floor on the fifteenth opened and closed as I slipped, falling and hitting my head on the landing between the eleventh and twelfth. As I swayed for a few seconds, the tenth shut off. When I got to my feet, the eleventh had gone off as well. I had a few moments to register the darkness that lay a single flight away from me. It looked too black to be merely shadows. The dim light from 12 above failed to illuminate any part of the floor below. It seemed to almost float up the stairwell, flowing like water in a raging river. I reached the 12th and had my foot on the first step of the next one when it shut off. Cold air rushed past. Looking back for just a moment, I saw that the heel of my left shoe was missing. Stumbling, I almost tripped again, but managed to regain my composure and pass the 13th floor just as it went off. With a burst of adrenaline that only panic can provide, I made it to the landing between 14 and 15 just as the 14th shut off. Looking up, I saw Kelsey holding the door to the hallway open, a terrified look on her face. With one last burst of speed, I dove, tumbling through the door just as the 15th went black. Instantly, a searing hot pain erupted near my right ankle. I collapsed on the hall floor, gagging and crying. My right foot had been messily severed at the ankle. Blood was spurting from the open wound and fragments of bone and skin littered the carpet right up against the door. Kelsey called the police and tied a tourniquet around my leg. The paramedics were there within 10 minutes. As I was loaded into the back of the ambulance, a police officer asked me what had happened. I tried to answer, but just managed to choke out a gasping breath. That was six months ago. I have a prosthetic now. The police searched the stairwell but found no trace of either my foot or Mick. They checked the security cameras on the first floor, but the feed cut out at 11.30 and only resumed a half hour later. I quit my job at that company, and Kelsey and I went our separate ways. I haven't spoken to her since, although I've been thinking about it lately. Last night, I was laying in bed when I received a text. Checking my notifications, I saw it was from Mick. In the message was a single video link. Against my better judgment, I pressed play. It showed the bottom of the stairwell at my old office building. A hand, ragged and bloody, reached out and opened a door that should have led to the first floor hallway. Instead, it led to the bottom of another stairwell. The camera traveled up a flight and opened the second floor door revealing another stairwell. It repeated these actions an endless number of times, the screen gradually getting darker and darker until it was pitch black. And in the background, I heard sobbing. <laughs>